Hey everyone, for tuning in to yet another episode in which I talk about issues related to public transport. And now, what I want to talk about is... I, I think I crayon a lot, by which I mean I draw a lot of um, maps of what subway systems or rail networks could be. The, the, there's this kind of term that comes from the London Rail Fan community, which is crayonistas, which kind of discount this as like kids drawing in crayon, which to be fair, it kind of is. Um, and I'm actually going to... Continue the crayon tradition, but I'm going to do a twist on it. Um, by which, I mean, I'm going to look at a commuter line, um, but instead of crayoning where it goes, because this essentially just comes from where the line exists already, I'm going to talk about uh, what connects to it, um, what the timetable should look like. Um, and this is going to be in the New York region. Now, Borners has been asking me why... New York. Why uh, do I keep doing New York things when I don't live there? And yeah, it's probably like the city that the, that's probably it is the city that the transit cost project was supposed to start with, but this is not transit cost project. This is something very different. Um, so I have two reasons why I'm going to do this. Um, the first relates to the stream and the second relates to my job. So the one that relates to the stream is that i um, I think it's useful to just show how this kind of planning works when you're doing timetable planning and, and how you're going to do integrated timetable planning. So that means looking at timetable and infrastructure at the same time. And um, how t and uh, the examples that I know of are American and non-European. Essentially, I never got the hunger pang to actually try to do a redesign of a big European city's um, regional rail network, first of all, because these are much more complex. Second, because the people doing this have actually heard of integrated planning. Um, it, it's actually a thing that even for like normal, like subway planning, it's something that I did. When I moved to Paris, I saw the map and I said, oh, wouldn't it be nice if X, Y, Z? And then I looked at um, our ATP's plans and they were already working on these things like um, extension of Metro 12 to hit um, the RER somewhere. Um, I can do a, a, a roar crayon, but the roar is extraordinarily complex. Um, so I can do easy mode and I can do hard mode, um, and the roar is kind of brutal mode. Um, and now the easy mode, I kind of have already done in Boston. So this, So you can go here. Regional, if you put regionalrail.net, not real, no, not regional real, it's not about using uh, the Saudi real as a regional currency. Regionalrail.net redirects to this, and this is just a bunch of things about, uh, just reports about how Boston could improve commuter rail, and there's even a regional rail explorer uh, made by our. Uh, um, tech team, uh, which will actually give you some examples of uh, uh, of how you could use of how you could use the regional rail system. So this would be things like, and so this would be things like, let's do um, so 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 let's see how using regional rail you could get between. Um, I don't know, Brandeis and North Station. I'm going to be kind of normy. And there's literally, and you can literally see the, the schedule. Um, like this. Um, Um, so there's that kind of thing, and this is because Boston is in many ways easy mode. And uh, could we get a London crayon? We are not going to do a cross rail report. Um, we did a bunch of interviews about Britain, which are useful as background, but they're not going to be a full report in the same way that uh, that Istanbul, Italy, and possibly tomorrow Stockholm. Um, our full reports. Um, 
I mean, even in Stockholm, where I did have trouble um, getting to a lot of people. I mean, I did do 10 interviews and read a ton of very public stuff. And in the United Kingdom, there's this problem. There's not a lot of transparency. So just getting the documents is kind of hard. In Sweden, it's all out there. I mean, you don't. I mean, in Sweden, you don't submit a freedom of information request. It's already public. Uh, and anyway, um, so yeah, London is a very hard node city. I don't think it is the hardest node city in the world. Um, Tokyo might be, but I'm not sure. Um, so this, there appears to be a Utica crayon on this. It's not going to be very interesting. I vlogged that before. Um, so New York, is, let's go to medium mode. And the reason I'm saying medium mode is because um, it is a very large and very complex place. Um, but it's a complex place in a way that is controllable. So what is there? Okay, so there are commuter lines that are not currently being shown at the Zoom level. Um, I'm going to highlight them and ask the people not to take the exact uh Distinction, the, the effect designations, literally. Um, so please don't argue with me over which lines are in which colors, just the colors highlight where the lines are. And uh, so the, um, so, so, so just as a medium mode, I mean, so there are all these commuter lines, but these are all commuter lines that are feeding New York. Now, what else is there in the LIR? There's a little bit of freight traffic, but only a little bit. Um, and, uh, and so it's possible to run it around the passenger trains. It's not trivial, but it's something that can be kind of segregated away. Um, and segregation is unfortunately not something that is alien to Slum Island. Um, different kind of segregation. Um, there's no intercity traffic on Long Island unless you count this up. Now, um, on the Northeast Corridor, so that's the New Haven, there is a lot of intercity traffic, but um, this, again, it can be segregated away. It's, it's intercity traffic. It's not some kind of random regional line, like let's say from Berlin to Dessau or Magdeburg or, or Rostock or um, or, or, or Galitz or, or, or any of these kind of very small cities that you're never going to actually invest in like very high quality trains to. Um, so because the Northeast Corridor takes you from New York to um, a place that is kind of crummy, but it's kind of big, you know, Boston. Um, so that does not exist as like a pure constraint. This is a constraint track sharing between the Northeast Corridor intercity and commuter trains, but so, but, but this does let you be a little flexible with things. Um, and the only place where there's a lot of really annoying freight traffic um, is the Jersey side, and this includes the West. So the way I currently grew this crayon, uh, the West shoreline does not get commuter rail service as a result. This is the West shoreline. I have done mega crayon versions where it does, um, but this is a freight main line. Um, even that, I think, is tractable, but it is not something that is completely trivial. Um, and, it, and it is harder than, uh, than Long Island. And so this is something that is, so again, Boston is easy mode. Boston has, I mean, Boston, they think that five freight trains a day is a heavy freight line. Um, and the trains don't run through. Um, it is easier to write timetables when they don't run through. The running is good. I videoed about this a couple of weeks ago. The running is good, but it does require you to be more careful with how you're doing, with how you're doing the timetables. Um, I mean, yeah, a little bit more planning resources and excellent resource for passengers, but this is a, a thing. And in New York, Penn Station is a thrift station, and essentially any commuter rail organization in New York involves extensive thrift running. Um, and so just as a matter of doing something that kind of highlights how to do this, I think it's more valuable to look at New York than at Boston. Um, there's also a kind of difference, I mean, not easy versus medium, but 
different. So if we're thinking about video games, maybe I'm just doing a different character class. One, it's maybe very well balanced. Okay, I finished the game playing a mage. Now let's play the game playing rogue. And if the game is balanced, it's not going to be harder or easier, but some challenges are easier. Others are harder. Others are just different. Um, and the mage versus rogue difference with doing New York versus doing Boston is that in Boston, um, okay, I X the regional rail explorer, but the um, but I can tell you what the frequencies are. The frequencies on the lines in Boston that we're proposing um, are mostly half hourly, farther out, and then 15 minutes closer in, and then in a few places the interline to more than that. Um, but a lot of this is based on a base half hourly system. Uh, so something like Boston to Worcester would be half hourly. Boston to uh, um, Boston to I don't know Boston to Providence is 15 minutes because there's an ad I think. Um, but Boston something like Boston to Lowell, uh, Haverhill, Newburyport, Rockport. Um, these are mostly um, to, uh, to uh, uh, Brockton, Plymouth. These are things that we're proposing mostly half hourly. Um, and this means that the timetable connections at the outer end um, have to be timed. So one of the things that um, I spent a lot of effort doing, and then I, I, and I kept insisting on this, and, this and, and because other people pointed out various constraints to me, we had to do certain design compromises and certain and insist on certain changes, um, is that, uh, for example, and I'm going to just talk about Boston and Brockton, and I know that I said New York, I will get to New York in a sec. Um, so the Boston Brockton line, it's called the Old Colony. Um, the, so, because, so Brockton is one of these kind of medium sized town centers that New England has very many of these. New England is kind of the most European part of the US in this way that um, it's, I mean, in New England and basically nowhere else in the United States, the people before urbanization live in villages. Um, outside New England, this is not how Americans live. They lived, okay, so in the South, they had plantations um, where there was a slavery in the lowlands and everywhere else, it was homesteading. So um, th so the way Americans, so this is by the way something that I kind of want to highlight is a, a very big US Europe difference that people on both sides of the pond don't necessarily get uh, because this difference is kind of less important now because in both on both sides of the pond people live in cities or in, in, and in their suburbs. This is how Americans lived. So this is just a random point in Ohio and yes you can find little villages but the way it actually worked was the, you know, there were these um, farm plots um, that were square on, on, on various grids each state had its own grid or a few grid of a grid of its own, just because um, these were so regular that if they had been, they could have continued to the point that they would run into issues with the Earth's curvature. Um, and each of these was a farm, and there was a household in the in, in, in that farm, and that household would never encounter other people except maybe once a week to go to church or sell in the commons. Uh, who is hard and who is very hard? Um, I think Chicago is easier than New York. Um, the problem with Chicago is that um, the ridership might not be there, and so um, a lot of the spending needs to be more delicate. But in terms of timetable complexity, um, it's not. And this is where I'm, uh, where I'm getting into it. When I'm pointing out that the United States didn't, didn't really have villages. Um, Europeans again lived in villages. Um, Americans lived like again. I don't know if the, if it was front plots this size and these were subdivided or this side or something. But um, you know, I can actually check this. So this is is this half a mile? This is a mile. Yeah, yeah. It was a lot smaller than this. It was eventually forty acres. So forty acres. This is a square mile, so it's like forty. So yeah, it was a quarter of this way. I guess a quarter mile by a quarter mile. Um, and um, so because and again, New England was not like this. Um, and the importance is that New England has all these stark 
um, village centers or at this point, I mean, urbanized so fast, these became town centers. Um, and these actually have some density around them. Not a lot, and a lot of it is, and the problem is that basically all of these places are very white flighty. So Brockton is very poor. Um, and if you're more middle class, you don't live in Brockton, you live outside Brockton. And this is something that recurs throughout the, um, throughout New England and throughout the parts of New York and maybe New Jersey that also have that kind of history. Um, and, um, and if you're the sort of middle class person who might move to a downtown condo loft as kind of a early gentrifier, you probably would not be doing so in Brockton when Boston exists. Um, and, um, the, but, but, but there's still stuff in here in, in the town center. Um, and the buses converge on the town center because maybe the buses are an artifact of, uh, when they were planned generations ago and maybe the town center was stronger than. And so, um, it actually becomes very important to time the trains and the buses to connect. And you focus on Brockton because essentially the entirety of the old colony system, which is three lines, Boston to Brockton, all the way to Middleborough, and arguably you can even extend this to, to Cape Cod. Um, a second line using the same trunk, which is to Plymouth, and a third line, which is um, kind of like the coast, um, not quite, but kind of hugs the coast for all of these really wealthy um, um, suburbs that look down on everyone who is less wealthy than they are. Uh, I think it was Hingham. One of them said, oh, EMV is a thing. Here's the EMV. Uh, they advertise that uh, everyone who is sufficiently rich can buy in their uh, um, exclusive community. Uh, they didn't build any housing. They just said, EMV, you can come buy houses here. So it's, it's these kinds of people. Um, and so it's these three branches, and essentially all of that is based on having it always an old direction time transfer in Brockton, where trains, so the trains run every half hour in each of these three branches in our plan. Uh, they're timed so that they pass each other at Brockton on the hour, every hour, every half hour, and the buses should also run every 30 minutes and then enter downtown Brockton a few minutes before the half hour and depart a few minutes after the half hour. So that is really important when you're doing a smaller city like Boston. Um, now, Berlin, Boston's the size of Berlin, and Berlin doesn't do half hour, really does 20 minutes, and this includes even at the Brockton range. Uh, Boston's less transit-oriented. Boston, like the, um, like I, I would defend the half hourly bit there. Now, in New York, it's very different because in New York, there are some of these lines. There's one that I spent quite a lot of time creating a timetable for, so let's not do it, which is called the Hempstead line. Oh, impressive. I managed to get it done with only one typo. This one. Um, and I then did the follow up because New York is full of annoying nitpickers, and by annoying, I mean really useful. Uh, advocates. Easier is excluding any new down... No, no, no. Um, yeah, no. So the terminal locations are worse in Chicago than in New York. Um, so, yeah, the thing about Chicago is that um, arguably Chicago, it's, it's like New York and Boston in that in, in some sense, it's just playing a different character class. Uh, class and I'm not going to start arguing over which one is playing Rogue, which one is playing Wizard, which one is playing Fighter. Um but it's maybe a little bit like that, because in Chicago, there are issues like which lines are freight train lines. I don't mean five trains a day, I mean 100 trains a day. Um, fun fact, even those 100 train a day main lines, like BNSF, I think, actually have more passengers than freight trains. Um, but the passenger trains are shorter. So the New York situation is that, so a line like Hampstead, I mean, it's probably this every 10 minutes, this every 10 minutes. So the idea is that, um, so right now, if you don't know the system very well, the orange line is what I'm kind of proposing as Hempstead, except that um, it's the one with the threes, so R3 something. Um, except, first of all, a lot of these stations don't exist. They should be added to the system as infill stations for more urban service on commuter rail. Um, then this exists, this doesn't. So there's a railroad that exists here. It actually, you might be able to see it on uh, Google Earth as kind of a gash 
like here. So this is called the central branch and used to go here. And I believe it, or I believe these didn't cross. I mean, they, they match, but the way this works, this, the central branch went to Babylon. That's kind of a different way of getting to Babylon from the north, from the north side lines and the south side lines. And this bit is actually in use. It's unelectrified, but some diesels uh, go from the Montauk line here via Babylon instead of going on the south, on the south side line, on the Babylon branch, they divert right the central branch to go here. Um, and so, uh, so this is in use. This is not. This is not. This is. There are people who I respect who think that they should be revived, and by people who respect, I mean Sandy Johnston. Um, blogged about this many years ago. Um, I don't think that is correct, mostly because I mean, look at the land use. I mean, yeah, you can redevelop, but I mean, you can also redevelop here or here. Um, so a line like this, if it's every 10 minutes, I mean, yeah, you need to move the buses, but it's not exactly a matter of transfer timing. This is really important. But what does become important? LA is hard. No, LA is very easy because LA barely has any, any legacy rail infrastructure. Um, LA is sad. It's not hard. Hard. I don't actually know if there's any hard in North America because there's basically no legacy infrastructure to deal with. Um, I mean, there's freight, but again, even in Chicago, um, it's only, it, it's something that can be isolated to a few lines. Hard. What is hard? London is hard. I don't think London is brutal. L I, let, let's call London hard mode. Paris is hard mode. Um, the Ruhr might actually be the hardest among the cities that I know something about. Um, Tokyo, I can't tell. I mean, Tokyo is... So, I mean, if you want to map Boston, New York, and Chicago into, like, Fighter, Rogue, and Wizard or something, then maybe you can add uh, Cleric and then Tokyo is one of them. I'm not sure Tokyo is that hard, and the reason Tokyo might not be that hard... So, so the thing is that in Tokyo, it's very complex, but Tokyo is also... Like, t Tokyo has one thing going for it. So, New York, you might notice that when I'm doing the city center crayon, and... These are higher costs than a blog because the blog post this comes from calls the Nordic cost and the Nordic cost of Riven. Um but um but it will defend something like this, maybe. But um but the point is that New York has a thing going for it, which is you don't need to do to be too creative when you have a city that's big enough and under our assumption has reasonable construction costs so that you can just so among these through routes. The only one that exists is the red one. The green one is gateway, doesn't exist. Um, and even only this part's being planned, not planned to Grand Central. This station is in full, it's not being planned by anyone. Um, the orange bit, yeah, this exists, this exists, but it's a, it requires a little bit of realignment to get them to be the right tracks at Penn Station. Blue, yeah, it exists up to Grand Central, but then this does not exist. This does not exist. This station needs to be mined as a cavern. I will be happy if it can be done for half a billion dollars. Um, um, which is less than some crossrail stations. Um, and some second avenue subway stations that were just oversized. Um, but this might actually need to be oversized like second avenue subway stations um, for this line and this line. And certainly there's no tunnel. Maybe you're not seeing it because of my head over this. There's certainly no tunnel between Lower Manhattan and uh, Staten Island. All right, so this, like the thing that I've been craning for 15 years, everyone says, oh, wow, this is really out there. Yeah. Um, and likewise, the this kind of murky yellow line, this one, it exists up until here. Up until here and this disused but parts of the right of way exist so this needs to be reactivated and this is again look at where the tunneling is um 
New York can't do that right now because New York is a sort of city where the part of them calling Gateway Grand Central six kilometers for two billion dollars. So just to understand, only the underwater part. So instead of six, make it about four, four and a half, five, something like that. This that is being that, that is said to be ten. And to be very clear, that is ten without stations. So this station is not part of the project. These surface improvements that I'm saying are four hundred million and are actually being budgeted multiple billion are not part of that project. And the connection the connection to Grand Central is not part of the project, and Penn Station remodeling is not part of the project. Um, so, yeah, no shit, New York is not building that, but if the construction costs in New York are even semi-reasonable, um, it could be building more. And the same is true of Tokyo. Tokyo, And it's also, the same also true of London. London just has some really drunk suburban alignments, like in the suburban parts of the city, there are some lines that go around in loops. New York has this in one place, which is here, and that loop has been broken by the um, by giving away parts of it to the subway. Um, and so this is why, um, so this is why I'm saying hard mode is things where you can't really uh, just build tunnels or things that um, have a bunch of centers that are very awkwardly located relative to each other. Or like, again, the roar, the Rhine roar is really annoying with how Köln is this beautiful through station, except that basically all inter-German travel enters it through uh, just one end from the east. And so unless you're going through Aachen, it is not useful as a first station unless you either pinch, which trains don't, or, I mean, they can, they just don't there. Or you go underground, uh, maybe not underground, but you go, you go on the Deutsch side. So you don't quite serve Köln, you go on the, I mean, it, it, it is in the municipal limits of Köln, but it's on the wrong side of the river. Um, and I don't mean the river like the Seine, I mean a river like the Rhine. Um, so yeah, that is very hard. So as I said, I'm going to do a medium example. I'm already pointing out to you um, issues that need to be addressed. So this is, a, this is a place where we're going electronics before concrete, organization before concrete, not instead of concrete. So realignments are permitted. Um, extra, like, like, I mean, we're not going to randomly quad track everything if we need to do local express separation because that would be wasteful, but we might be able to do that a little bit. Um, this is not a shoestring budget. Um, however, it is important to make sure that um, if the line has any urban service, so that would be the Hempstead line example that I blogged, uh, that, it is a that it actually be useful as urban service. So the Hempstead line, again, if this is every 10 minutes and this is every 10 minutes, then, uh, okay, they drawing to every five minutes, you're not going to have time to bus this over here. However, you are going to do something with the buses, right? Um, yes, exactly. Um, and the Hohenzollern Brücke is very slow. I walked on it and I timed the trains. It's like 60 kilometers an hour or something. 50? It's like the Stadtbahn. Um, and so if you build this, for example, if you build this crayon, this is more extensive than what um, I did on Google Earth. And the Google Earth, like, like I like calling things like the three line system. And, and, and when I crayon, I've been carrying the same thing over and over to the point that I um, have consistent names for these. So red, mine was the colors match on Google and ink tape. Red is line one, the existing. Line two is green, it's gateway and Grand Central. Maybe a different shade of green, whatever. Line three is the orange and this is LIRR local to Empire connection. Uh, line four, and then so that's the three line system. Four line system includes blue here, which takes Harlem line to Staten Island. And line five is the south side system, including this and this, um, to the Erie system. So it's these lines and this line. Um, and then separately, LIR Northside Express is over here called um, R6. So five-line system includes this is just east side access, no through running. Six-line system connects this, which is going to be annoying. Um, they, they kind of block themselves. They, they can redo it, but they need to extricate and disassemble the TPM, which they literally entombed here. Um, so connecting this to... Jersey over here, it's 
line six, line seven. Again, not depicted here just because I think there's, I think it's slightly underserved line five. Like on, if this is built, I believe that line five is going to be the most crowded. So line seven, you might notice, takes things that are near line five and essentially doubles them. Um, but anyway, um, the point is that if this, if something like this is built, and you have something like a drain every five minutes on this, or even if you don't build this and you still and just use the existing capacity, which you absolutely can to do a drain every five minutes like this. Um, for example, the buses are going to look very different. They're, they're going to look different because right now there's um, because right now the, the way the buses work in Eastern Queens is they don't feed the LIRR because the LIRR is infrequent. The LIRR is expensive. Um, so the bus redesign for Queens doesn't even deal with the LIRR because it's about buses that come every 10 or 12 minutes. And these, first of all, a lot of these stops don't exist. This stop does not exist. This stop, I believe, is crew only. Um, but more importantly, even if this, the, the, but these stops exist, but I believe they're served every hour of peak, maybe every half hour. Who the hell needs that? And, of course, at premium fares. Um, so if there's strat integration, if there's schedule integration, um, and by schedule integration, I mean, I don't mean time transfers, because who the hell times the transfers when it's a train every five minutes? Um, you don't even time bus rail transfers at 10 minutes. But if it's every five minutes, it means that the buses, maybe instead of going, instead of having uh, these very long east-west buses, um, for example, there's um, quite a lot of bus ridership on Hillside, so here. But maybe, if this is a fast and useful for urbanites line, then you run fewer bus lines on Hillside, and you run more buses um, on things that connect. So bear in mind that um, the locations need to be chosen very judiciously to connect, which is definitely um, a consideration. Um, so, for example, Francis Lewis is very important. North-South route does not have a stop on this. Maybe this should be changed. I'm not sure. But Springfield does. This is Queens Village. So a bunch of buses would go here to feed Queens Village. A bunch of buses would divert here to feed Hollis. Um, there's a lot of bus service um, also from Southeast Queens. Um, yes, exactly, exactly. Um, exactly, bro. Um, so, even more so, even more important to the of Southeast Queens, Northeast Queens, again, a little, I, I mean, yeah, there, you, you could connect the buses over here to Bayside also, it's useful, to places like that, but there's a big desert in between, um, places like Union Turnpike, um, which would still have a lot of East-West bus traffic, um, but Southeast Queens is full of these very busy, at least rush hour, buses that go southeast toward Jamaica. Um, because, um, yeah, you can ride the LIRR, some of these stops exist. Uh, not this one, but these. But they're infrequent and they're expensive. Um, and honestly, the trains are not even that fast. I mean, the trains are faster than buses, but um, if you need to change in Jamaica, sometimes it's not even properly timed. And so, maybe, um, if these were improved, and I'm not saying maybe, definitely if these were improved, you would have fewer buses running on Marek, um, and more buses running on things like Linden to connect uh, to connect these stops, or, um, or honestly, for me, people could walk. Um, and so, this is an, an important bit of bus connections, which is... Um, when possible, I'm not saying you should be very religious about it, but when possible, put the infills where they could connect to buses. And it's something that I did with, with this crayon um, for Penn Station Access. So this project is called Penn Station Access. Um, doesn't, oh, it does. So this part, New Rochelle, to Penn Station only hosts intercity trains. I mean, there's LRR here, but um, there's no Metro North. So... From about this, from this junction, up until here, the only passenger rail user, user is Amtrak. There's freight, but it is segregated on its own track with very little traffic. Exactly. Um. So, um, Penn Station Access is a project that is currently under construction. Uh, Governor Cuomo made it a priority. It's very expensive, but something important did happen for it. The LIRR honchos were against it. 
um, because this would mean Metro North entering their territory of Penn Station. So they kept saying, what about our capacity, something, something. And then uh, the head of the LRR, Helena Williams, uh, her job was realigned with her um, skills and competence. Uh, that is to say she was fired. Um, and uh, suddenly all the LIRR voices were silenced. And uh, the and the project is continuing. Again, it's very, at very high cost. I, I would not say, oh, Cuomo gets things done. No, he doesn't. He gets bad things done. Um, but there's two additions to Penn Station access here on the map. The first is uh, there is the stop Astoria that has been studied many times. Uh, and unfortunately, this was rejected, the stop. Um, and it was rejected first because of real construction difficulties. Not impossible, but difficulties. There's a steep grade here. Um, and this area is pretty well developed, so it, so the cost of this is not going to be, you know, the usual Bostonian 20 million or Berlin, maybe. Honestly, Berlin's probably not going to be that much less for, for a section of that length. It's going to be more. Um, but second, because they were assuming uh, infrequent off-peak operations, and uh, uh, and they were assuming uh, uh, premium fares, the ridership projected projected at the station was very weak. Now, this is a very busy subway station. Um, I believe even Corona, maybe seventeen thousand boardings a day. Um, let me actually check this. Uh, New York subway ridership. Okay, I don't need the top ten. I just want to. Okay, so they have. I guess. I, I guess. So they have this page with um, Corona numbers. Um, so they're telling you what the top ones. And then, um, download our subway's ridership data. Oh wow! I didn't download this before. Um, this is going to take a little bit, and I am sorry for my computer. As I have told you guys many times, uh, this computer at this point should be receiving a notice to go to school. It's that old. And to be very clear, uh, I mean school and not kindergarten. So Queens, it's in alphabetical order, and I guess you might not be able to see the station names. Yeah, extending the subway is uh, also sold, and, uh, and the extension of the subway is something that's being studied very seriously, because first of all, it's an airport extension, and airport expansion is overrated. Um, as it happens, this is a good one. Uh, I mean, I would rather they overrate um, the extension of the NW to the airport and not, I don't even know what, but I mean, the, the stuff that they're doing in Paris, for example, with airport, exp and, um, with, with airport rail connections is obscene. But anyway, okay, so I moved my face, so now you can see the station names. So these are going to be Astoria and Astoria Dittmars. So Astoria Dittmars, okay, I have no idea. I, I imagine this was some kind of closure. So before closure was this, and the station was this. Story that Mars. Obviously, you should not add the relief station used when Astoria Boulevard was closed. Right? I mean, this is a slightly fake number, but these numbers are real. Um, and they were not projected. So bear in mind, if this is fifty million dollars to build the infill station, um, there are stations in Boston in, in the suburbs that cost this uh, that cost this much to build in Newton in an extremely constrained environment, not an elevated one, but a trench with a very narrow space for platforms, and uh, and apparently they need to build elevators and not ramps because of the most ridiculous accessibility issue. By ridiculous, I mean the bridge to which the ramps would go is a little bit too steep to be accessible in the sidewalks, and then there's some accessibility issues on the sidewalks. Um, but at any rate, so this would be, if this were 50 uh, million and the commuter rail station got something close to this, it would be a slam dunk. 50 million, remember, it's not 50 million divided by 15,000 because 15,000 is just boardings. And, you need, and I mean, the, 
everyone who boards at this station is also counted as a boarding somewhere else when they go back. So this is 50 million divided by 30,000. Maybe not, maybe you're not going to get the full 30,000 because the subway gets you to more places, but this is faster and this gets you to quite a lot of places as well. Um, but again, it was dropped because of these poor operating assumptions. Um, so that's change number one. Change number two um, is uh, here. And you might be able to see this with this, with the stations looking abnormally close together. The plan is plimp, 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 plimp. Hunts point, um, Parkchester, I believe. Um, Morris Park, I believe this is going to be Morris Park. It's going to be called Morris Park, same as this. And Co-op City. Um, you might notice that Co-op City is not here. It is here. So still a ways away. Um, but um, this is, I think, an important connection to the Fordham bus. This is the busiest bus in the Bronx. It's It keeps trading places with other buses to be top three in the city. Um, and yes, the Fordham bus does go here, but it's a little bit circuitous here. So I might as well just have this be the connection point. Um, going, going from the west. So this is what I mean by maybe try to align the initial stops in the city with good bus location um, in a way. That, uh, so this is a kind of example of bus rail, of coordinated bus rail design. Um, uh, yeah, the issue is, uh, so in so about station costs, um, what I was told in Boston is that the problem is um, they don't have standardized design. Now, bear in mind that in Boston, the station costs are not especially high. They're like, I think, one half as high as, or one third as high as in the New York area. Um, Philadelphia is, in the, is per station less than Boston, but per length of platform, the same, or would be a little bit less. Um, so you want standardized designs is the main. Um, and mostly you don't need elevators. Mostly you should be doing it everything. With, you should be doing everything with ramps, also not overpasses, but underpasses. There's this kind of... I don't know if it's an American preference, just a Massachusetts thing. They were told that passengers prefer up and over, not down and under. Downs and, under um, downs and unders are cheaper. Do the down and under. Um, like most of the arguments for up and over are someone was someone is paranoid about crime because it's America and people in America aren't any more paranoid about crime than elsewhere. But there's more of a mechanism in which one in which one culture in the United States makes um, becomes a policy becomes a policymaker. Um, so anyway, um, so I, I gave you one reason why I'm going to do New York, and this is because, um, first of all, it's medium, it's not as easy. Um, it's also a different set of challenges. Um, I mean, yeah, I could do a New York, I mean, if people really wanted me to do it, I could do a New York thing, which is like the Danbury branch or the Waterbury branch, where it's something that's possibly very bottom-like. Um, also New England, um, part of Canada. But um, instead, I'm going to maybe do something different. Uh, and again, it's about different kinds of coordination, not to a half-hourly bus, but to other things. Um, so I give you one reason. Um, in order to introduce some things, so we're going to do things involving um, urban buses. The other thing, as I said, there's also something related to my job. Now, in theory, this is my job, right? The Transit Coast Project. Well, this was my job. We're done. I mean, the Sweden report is going to be up this week, most likely. Uh, there's going to be a webinar about it. So this is, as you can see, a little old, but there's going to be a webinar about it, I don't know, early September, most likely, about Sweden. And then we're going to do a, um, a big event in New York late September, early October, about everything, including New York, um, and the connection and the, and the conclusion. And so the, um, and, and so this is done. So what are we moving on to? We're moving to a bunch of things, but one of them is, um, high speed rail for the Northeast corridor. And this is, and for this, it's really important to also think about how it connects with commuter. Oh, hi, thanks for Nanki. Um, and so it's really important to, think um, about how these things connect. And this means that I'm effectively compelled to do an example 
why is it? Oh, right, because I just changed. Sorry, I thought it was playing with my crayon too much. Now I just changed which uh, what what the active layers were. Um, so it's important, I think, to look at how things are going to connect uh, between intercity and regional rail. Um, and I mean, I'm not going to literally do my entire work on stream or anything. I do know people who do that. I know. Um, I know some graphic designers um, who are, or, or some or, or some game developers who are literally going to show like who are like, literally go on stream and like do um, and, and do some graphics uh, or, or 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 show or, or showcase some coding that they're doing. I'm not going to quite do that, but um, but I think it's useful to give at least a taste. Now, um. On pre, so this is going to be kind of an interplay between crayon and planning. Crayon is related to planning, but is not the same. And I want to make it very clear how they differ. And I don't mean in the sense that planning is something that's maybe prestigious, if kind of um, maybe maybe not prestigious in the sense of you know being an astronaut is prestigious, but prestigious in the sense that like you got solid middle class work in that. And crayoning is typically done by people on forums, often students who wish to later get planning jobs are going to do something completely different. Um, so I don't mean in, in that sense. I mean it in the sense that Crayon is the finished product. So when you are a city and you're doing a massive expansion of your rail network, let's call this, uh, let's give the city the name uh, Paris. Okay, I mean, Paris is doing massive rail expansion right now. Right? It's building Compagnie Express. It's uh, building the RER uh, E extension. It's building um, some metro extensions that are not Compagnie Express. Uh, so, so Paris is, is so, um, so Paris is planning to expand the system by I don't know 200 kilometers in the next 15 years. That's a lot. And yeah, the final product is a crayon where there's a map. Okay, I put in Grand Paris Express. Okay, I don't mean uh, I don't mean the Wikipedia firm, but uh, Grand Paris Express, the their website has a map. Okay, I mean they're saying, uh, so this is maybe a schematic map and not a perfectly geographically accurate map, which is what I would prefer. But I mean, it doesn't matter. This is crayon. Okay, people have done people have drawn crayon on schematics. Okay, people in London. Crayon on the tube map, which is schematic. The first crayon that I learned was um, people crayoning on the New York subway map, which is semi schematic. Um, and so, um, the, so uh, and so, yeah, they're showing you where you can go. Why? Because this is important. Because it is important for planners communicating to the general public to first think where the lines are going, and then communicate to the general public. Where they can take a train. Hi, uh, this is uh, hi. If you're um, around Bondi, you can take the train, uh, and not and not just radially, but also circumferentially to all these places and things like that. This is important part of planning. Um, so this is crayon. I mean, it's official crayon that people got paid a lot of money to produce, including some marvelously bad parts. That is to say, M17 just kill that, and M18. This is just just embarrassing. This is embarrassing. This is pretty bad also. Um, like literally the reason they're doing this is because they want even more airport connectors so that people don't have to see poor people in the RERV. Um, this is not even bad as an airport connector, it's just bad as like a, a connection between two rich suburbs with a lot of low density in between because the, they figured that, oh, we're gonna build the actually useful lines. Oh, but wait, uh, why the rich suburbs would also want a little bit. So let's build them this. This is literally the thinking behind this one. So I'm not saying that this is good crayon. This is crayon that unfortunately, um, uh, that unfortunately has a lot of, um, a lot of drawbacks to it, but I mean, it's crayon. I mean, trust me. There, there, I've seen some. I've seen worse crayon. Not Paris crayon, but worse New York crayon by New York crayonistas. We're not. We're thankfully not getting paid for it. Um, and so this is part of the plan. So what is the distinction between the plan and the crayon? Well, the crayon is synthetic. This is a synthesis. Planning is analysis. Planning is you need to look at 
all of the possible alignments. Now, this has gotten a lot more complex now that there are tunnel boring machines because tunnel boring machines have freed the... Uh, so tunnel boring machines have freed uh, um, ha have freed metro planners from the need to follow streets. So when New York was planning the subway in the 1900s, they could just say, say okay, we're going to look at the street. Um, and this person today, even with tunnel boring machines, because, I mean, yeah, I mean, let's say we're doing an extension of the subway under no strand. So here. Um, Yes, you could go a little bit around with a tunnel boring machine. But why? I mean, the station locations should be where there's the most demand, and this is the intersections of no strand with major highway, with major, sorry, with major avenues. Well, this is the only one that's called Highway King's Highway, and the same is true of the Utica. I mean, yeah, maybe you can do creative things like uh, um, go around some obstacle for a little bit, but. That's not the big part, um, but but often in places that don't have such relentless grids, um, they do uh, draw a lot of um, different alignments. And this is something that I saw in Stockholm. In Stockholm, when they built near Tinnedbanen, um, the um, let, let me see if I can find the, the pick. Okay, uh, okay. Yeah. Um, so this is something that they called Naka crayon. But again, this is official grab. This is uh, this is a screen grab from the planning. Uh, let's shrink a little bit. This is a screen grab from the planning for the metro extension to Naka, and metro extension is currently being built, which I think. Should have, what was supposed to be to have opened around now and said will open in a couple of years. Um, I'm forgetting whether in what the timeline is 2027 20, maybe. Um, but this is so this is from the 2000s and because this was all going to be not with the TBM but with the uh, uh, mining, um, with, with, with really and blasting, they had many different options. So yeah, they wanted to see okay maybe they're going to go through um, you call, uh, through your garden. Um, maybe they're going to go through, um, maybe they're going to go through parts of, uh, of, uh, Södermalm. And if they're going to go through Södermalm, where are they going to serve Södermalm? Um, and one of the options was even to curve a little bit, and yeah, it'd be a little circuitous, but it would serve, uh, Slissen, which is kind of the center of the neighborhood, and almost kind of like the second downtown of, uh, Stockholm and Sonsin. The down, the central business, the center of Stockholm is off. Right here, this is where all the three metro lines intersect. Um, two of them go to Slissen, and then one goes here, one goes here. The third goes here to uh, uh, to Kunstler to to Kunstler Garden, and then um, they had yeah a bunch of options uh, for how to go. And I believe they're doing the yellow one. Um, they're doing either the yellow or the green. I'm forgetting which one because they're going to uh, because Sofia's. Uh, so they're not going to go to Slissen, they're going to go to uh, Sofia. Um, it's actually a really difficult station to build. Um, I think it might be the... I don't know if it's going to break world records for how deep it is, but it's definitely going to break Stockholm records. Um, it's an elevator-only station to the point that they have to use some of the access tunnels uh, that were used for the um, digging as to, to, leave them, so to, to leave them open as emergency egress tunnels from here. Um... And then going toward Naka, because the idea is to serve Naka. It's not a specific corridor they're trying to say. Yeah, serving like more stations in Sedermalm, that's nice, but that's not the goal. Okay, The goal is not add capacity to Se to Um, the, I, I believe that in Sedermalm, the um, pressing capacity constraint is not something that this would alleviate. I believe that pressing capacity constraint is actually not about um, going to city center. It's going a little bit beyond city center. So this line, the red line, goes like this, city center. Um, then, like, this is... And then it goes like this. Um, and then it goes to the university. Um, and in fact, it goes to both universities. And um, my understanding is that the uh, class times uh, are sufficiently coordinated 
that um, there's uh, there's overcrowding specifically in the um, in the morning just before coordinated class times at KTH. Um, maybe at SU, I'm not sure. I don't think KTH and SU are coordinated with each other, but um, the but but I was told that the worst crowding is specifically red line going a little bit beyond city center toward here. Um, and the blue line extension is not going to affect that. Um, and so the so the, so this is very much an uh, a, a surface, not a capacity extension. Um, and so yeah, it, it, it's worthwhile to look at all the different places that you can serve. Um, and so there are many alternatives. Uh, many, there are many alternatives here. Um, six of them. And so the um, and even that I imagine it was after they went in this row. Not even five, not even six, seven, because there's five B. Um, and uh, so it's so so when you have TBNs or when you mine, you have a lot of these different things. So plans need to look at all of these. Um, so the crayon is, in a sense, the finished product of planning. Oh, there's echo. Ugh. Let me try something. Um, is it better now? Thanks, Renee. Um, I'm gonna. I mean, I, I silenced my. I don't. I don't think it comes from the sound system, but you never know. Maybe it's the. Um, maybe it's the fan. Weird. Yeah. Um. Hmm. This is really weird. I'm. I, I'm sorry about this. The. I'm not going to repeat how I'm abusing my computer by uh, keeping a six-year-old thing out of school, but um, at any rate, um, oh, around the time I switched from Inkscape, weird, weird, oh, it's because of my computer fan, right, I'm, I'm feeling the um, heat, um, I'm going to try to uh, use my headphones, um, and I'm going to ask that people have uh, the people respect it when uh, the audio might die. So let's see. Okay. Uh, okay. How about, about now? Is, is it is it better, same, same or worse? Do an activity. Oh, it's worse now? Shit. Okay. Okay. This is really weird. This is really weird. The, um, I guess, that, again, I think it's my computer fan, and I don't know how to get it not to do this. Um, I, I guess they could have had it in my fan. The fan is mostly on the left side of my computer, and last time I had a microphone on the right. Um, Yeah, yeah, I do, do not know why the echo is like this. I'm really sorry. Um, hmm. What well, well, yeah, I know. I mean, it went back to what it was before. Um, I, okay. Yeah, I'm capturing audio. audio. No, no, I'm not capturing audio from the streaming browser at all. I am uh, recording audio direct from uh, from OBS. Yes. No, no, I'm not my phone. Uh, my, my phone is not working. I mean, I can try to tell this and ask if it makes things better or whatever. Because, again, literally, my uh, computer is not a good Like, I think it's... Huh. Oh, I know what is going. Um, there are two mixers that are currently... Okay, I'm, I'm going to try something, something and then I'm going to ask you to tell me how bad this is, okay? How is it now? I, I know what happened. What happened was that the um, auxiliary mic thing, which was off all this time, turned itself back on. Remember how um, 
th th those of you who were here before I started farting, um, had to wrestle with this until I went to, until I put the audio input capture back. Yeah, okay, so this is, so the issue is that there are two different things that capture audio here, and at any given time, uh, one of them might decide to uh, go on a uh, strike, demanding, I want to say higher pay, but any pay, it's not like I'm paying for my computer. I mean, yes, I paid for my computer, but you know, or rather I, I didn't, it was a, it, it was a gift six years ago, but um, it's a, it, the computer was paid, it, it, it's not like computers as a service, it's not hardware as a service. At any rate, okay, um, we have solved the mystery of, oh my god, why? And now let's go back to Crayon. So as I, so as I said, um, this is something that I think is really important to just highlight how planning works, but also how um, uh, that it's kind of coordinated planning, but also um, it's something that's going to be useful when I need to come up with a Northeast corridor plan. And this is, again, a different sort of plan in Crayon because it's not actually going to be that hard to come up with Crayon. But that is to say, one part, one possible plan, and the plan's going to be better than the current one because I'm violating a lot of assumptions that are unnecessary but are treated as sacrosanct in American planning. So, for example, one assumption is that you are not allowed to actually timetable commuter trains and intercity trains together. You have to provide some kind of track separation, or else, uh, and you kind of need to assume on each side, commuter or intercity, the other maybe arbitrarily late. Um, and again, this is a, an assumption that is in some cases warranted. It is not in the case of the Northeast Corridor, and the reason is that freight traffic exists but is light. Um, most of it has been moved to parallel lines. Um, that's the first thing. The second thing is that the Northeast Corridor is fairly self-contained in the sense that things that are not Northeastern commuter trains, or again, the few freight trains which are slotted specifically around the passenger trains, there aren't a lot of these. So there's the Amtrak long distance trains, but they enter all enter from Chicago. They can be held at Chicago for as long as necessary. And honestly, this is gonna be ruffling feathers, but it's it's the correct thing to do, but and, and you know, it can arbitrarily complicate it if you want and increase operating costs needlessly. But the correct thing to run the way to run the Northeast Carter is trains go between Boston and Washington. Um until there's any extension farther south, trains that enter from Virginia terminate at DC and, uh, at Washington Union Station and passengers transfer. And, and the reason for that is that the frequency between New York and DC is going to be high. How high? I mean, there are people who will tell you a train every five minutes. I think that's unrealistic if it's just high speed trains between Boston and Washington. Um, but uh, I think maybe it's realistic if you build a nationwide high speed rail network. But um, certainly something like a train every 15 minutes should be should, should fill practically on day one, maybe even a train every 10 minutes. When it's an intercity train every 15 minutes, fuck your time, f fuck your once you tried, fuck your time, your, your transfer timing. If your train can be arbitrarily delayed because it's running on freight track in um, the Carolinas or something, um, then it gets to DC whenever the intercity trains that go Washington to Boston are not are not going to wait for you. Just get just get the next one. Like I mean, there should I mean there should be some kind of th ticketing, obviously. Um, and if your connecting train is late, obviously you get rebooked on the next one. Um, fear of charge, of course, not just fear of charge, it's negative charge because it is the railroad's responsibility to get you there on time. But um, the trains aren't going to wait for you. Um, and this is something you can do when the trains run every 15 minutes. Um, you can't do it when the trains run a few times a day. In fact, um, in, in fact, um, for example, the, the trains to Springfield, um, on the Northeast corridor, they do run through, I don't say it's possible, they should run through just with an electrified, again, um, mostly separated from other things, um, system, um, so the trains go like this, and then this, New Haven to Springfield or beyond, is a guaranteed connection. And uh, so if the so if um the tra so the trains that don't run through, um, but make you connect to New Haven, um, if one train is late, the other will wait for it. 
Which is, again, it's something that's understandable if it's, if it's a train that runs twice a day. Don't do it if the train runs every 10 or 15 minutes, which these trains should. Um, so because you have these tricks, like use high frequency to break guaranteed connections that are going to lead to cascading delays, you can actually have a system that's highly uh, a system that's highly punctual. And this is um, um, yeah. Um, and this is going to be important. And this is also going to be important just for real speed as well, because in Germany, it turns out that uh, our glorious uh, system designed around punctuality and not near uh, speed between the largest cities in supposedly inferior countries like France. Um, so, the Spiegel, so, so the Spiegel is very good at this kind of investigative reporting. This is not recent. This is not about the recent collapse in reliability on the East End in the last six months or seven months. This is from 2019. Um, um, they point out that uh, something like, there's there something like 25%, 20 to 25% puffer. Um, and yes, it does mean buffer. Uh, it, it's not bad. Um, and just to put it in perspective, in Switzerland, which is also a very highly interlined system, it's seven percent, just because they systematically eliminate delays. In France, which is not very good at these things, it's ten to thirteen percent. The puffer. Um, and so. The and, and in France, a lot of this buffer time comes from the fact that the train might be delayed by onward connections onto classical lines, which exist everywhere. And for example, so for example, Paris to uh, for example Paris to Marseille, um, some of the trains on that line, even trains that go to Marseille, continue onward to Toulon or even to Nice. And these trains can be delayed by going so long on a classical line, and these can then delay the high-speed line where delays very rarely originate. And the same is true of Bordeaux. And, um, and in Germany, of course, there's much more of this kind of um, extensive interline, extensively interline system to the point that people are starting to realize that it's actually going to improve reliability to do what Germany says it uh, what, what Germany portrays is in, is in opposition with reliability, which is completing a high-speed rail network, because then at least the high-speed trains will have their own um, dedicated network. Now, I said that you can schedule things around, and you don't need to have separate tracks, and this is absolutely true. But um, this is only true up to a point, and um, so it's really important to build the extra tracks where they are necessary, which Germany has not done. Um, France mostly has uh, done this. The main blocks are lines that are, are just, it just happens that there's a very important city past the high speed line uh, like uh, Toulouse and Nice and uh, there's no real alternative except building all the way there um, which is being done with Toulouse not with Nice just because of, I have no idea who has the best balance um, I I mean, I would not. I mean, I would not swear by Korean construction costs for high-speed trains, though. Um, for high-speed trains, honestly, for if you want to do cheap construction, just do France or Spain. Um, maybe Belgium. I'm not sure. Um, the, the the main issue is to avoid overbuilding. Um, now, Spain has overbuilt, but in terms of just building high-speed lines to ridiculously small cities. Um, but what they build, they build cheaply. Um, but it's again, it's not a construction cost project. So the idea is here to look at a lot of alternatives because again, it's not crayon. Again, I could crayon a timetable, and because it's going to be a coordinated timetable, because it's going to not assume that uh, the line is um, free for all, because it's going to um, figure out how to set standards so that um, trains aren't going to randomly delay other trains at flat junctions. Um, this is going to be 7% padded and not 25% padded. Um, and that saves you so much running time. Um, j just getting just getting a reliable system is going to save you so much running time. Um, um, just fixing the last 
and to Grand Central, this is the la literally the last mile into Grand Central. It's not Amtrak, it's Metro Metro North, but still, literally the last mile to Grand Central costs three to four minutes. Four minutes. It costs four minutes because it's a, it's a 10 miles an hour speed limit and the bumper trucks can be 30 miles an hour with ease. And yes, this includes um, redoing the uh, turnouts, but these are not that hard turnouts to, um, to redo, to be honest. Um, I mean, you need to make sure you pick the straight path and so on, but I mean, if you know how to turn relatively fast and to um, not assume that any train can go on any station track um, when it's that complex of a ladder track and when you use 20th century and 19th century technology for the turnout, yeah, you can literally say four minutes in the last mile to Grand Central. Grand Station is not four minutes, I think it's maybe one minute on each side, one and a half minutes on each side, but still. Um, so when you do all these things, you're actually saving time and you're making the system more reliable. Um, but again, there need to be a lot of different options because this is very sensitive to assumptions. For example, how much commuter rail traffic are we assuming? Um, is there a gateway? Has gateway been built? Because they have written a timetable that I'm not sure I will swear by now, but I have written timetables um, for this part. So New York to Jersey, to New York to New Jersey, where uh, the um, so, 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 so I've so I've done this in a way that um the what's it called um that assumes no gateway. So uh, for example, uh, because I'm assuming only 24 trains per hour may enter, this means flowing away two of the commuter trains that enter at rush hour and essentially giving these slots. So instead of right now it's 20 commuter for Amtrak. Now the four Amtrak are kind of bad because a lot of them are not even for the Northeast corridor. Um, but it is what it is. And um, changing that to six Northeast Corridor Amtrak, 18 commuter, and then essentially using the Amtrak commuter trains to demolish commuter demand out of Trenton. Because if Trenton is, is an intercity rail stop, and if you don't do something silly like charge higher fares on the fast train, which has more capacity because the fast train only stops in major cities and therefore it can uh, be made longer because it's easier to um, lengthen platforms at three stations that to lengthen platforms at 30 stations. And uh, the intercity train is faster and this means that the, uh, um, and, and this means that the, for example, wage of the driver of the train is uh, lower per kilometer, it's the same, maybe even with a little bit of a premium per hour, but a little bit lower per kilometer. And this is a train that is not peaky. Why is it not peaky? Because, yeah, I mean, you can absorb a couple thousand people from Trenton and a couple um, peak trains, and maybe you can even sell them standing tickets, um, which might be annoying, but this is like 20 minutes they can stand. Um, if, if it's a, a high-speed rail, this is 20-something minutes. Um, then uh, you, so, so either by selling signing tickets at the same rate, or uh, and then if there are seats, they can take the seats. Um, but um, but this is just rush hour, and rush hour I don't think is going to be the absolute worst peak here. It's again, it's a, it's me doing a lot of hacks because there's always the day is always find ways to uh, spend the least money. One of the ways you're spending the least money, and this is I think a Northeast Carter specific one, is that um, the locations of the cities are such that there are going to be a lot of different peaks. So um, Trenton to New York, and even Philly to New York, so it's probably going to be bigger, uh, is going to be uh, a, it's going to produce some trad rush um, hour peak. Uh, people living here or here and commuting to Manhattan. Um, less, less so here in Philadelphia, just because um, it's going to be a, a longer trip. Like I think New York to Philadelphia at high speed rail speed would be about 40 something minutes one way, which people absolutely do, but that's mostly if you have two body problems, um, because um, this is not going to be a cheap trip anymore, and probably if you can afford that, you can just afford to live in New York. So it's, it's I think, mostly for two body problems, and maybe the two body problem is live in Trenton and reverse commute and, um, for the Philly partner. Um, and um, so again, this is going to be tried 
community, can maybe also this from New Haven and Stanford, but then you're also going to have a lot of other people. Because, for example, intercity travel is not, um, it, it does, does not peak at normal rush hour. Um, in, for example, the TGV, um, which is it, which is used by commuters, but not very much. Or, there are not a lot of convenient locations that are this close to Paris. Um, the Northeast is a lot denser than France. Um, and France doesn't really have any of these um, cities that are very close to each other. So, yeah, I mean, you can refer, you, you can commute from, I don't know, two or something, but it's more than an hour. Um, and uh, so, so there isn't a lot of that. Um, so the, the TGV peak is uh, weekend. It's a weekend travel. The um, busiest TGV days are uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, to the point they rotate the trains to maintenance Monday through Thursday. So they don't have full availability on weekdays except Friday. They have maybe, I, I think the way it works is that one quarter of the trains are unavailable each weekday omitting Friday in order to uh, have more frequency during the weekend. Um, uh, am I worried about standing passengers increasing egress times? No, because they're uh, going to be, so standing passengers mostly increase egress times when you have to walk past them. And the egress time is only going to be a real problem in New York and the standing passengers are going to get off in New York. Um, like that plus festivals, I don't think it's going to be a big deal. Um, like the, the standing passengers, I think it's just going to be commuters from and, and this kind of setup from New Haven and Trenton. So people who don't have luggage um, or are very experienced in this, they just stand near the door or something uh, and then they just get out very quickly. And then, yeah, maybe the intercity passengers would be a little slower, but I mean... Remember, the, the passengers egress very, experienced passengers egress very fast when there's level boarding. Um, and there's already going to be like buffer in the schedule for that because I'm not assuming 30 second, I'm not assuming 30 second dwell times, I'm assuming 60 seconds, maybe even, maybe possibly even two minutes in New York. Um, probably not, but maybe just one minute like Osaka, but like Shin Osaka, but. Um, in two minutes, it would be trivial. I think one minute would also be trivial. Um, and so, um, the, and the thing is, the, so the intercity travel uh, peak is uh, is different. It's it's weekends. So because of these distances, you're going to have both. Um, they're also going to be day tripping. So things like day trips between New York and D.C., New York and Boston. Um, these may be trend peak uh, in the inbound direction. So in the morning, but even then, it may not be. I mean, they can be getting getting in at like 10 or 11 and then getting out later. Um, there's also the issue that um, there's, there's also the issue that white collar work has been steadily um, becoming less picky uh, over time. Uh, I want to say that the lawyer hours are about an hour later than everyone else in New York. So lawyers, instead of working nine to five, work in theory ten to six and practicing like ten to eight or something. Tech worker hours are very offset. Like the sort of rich people who let, let, let me put it this way. Um, this is a little bit um, too correlated, unfortunately. But the sort of rich people who live on the North Shore of Long Island or um, on Gold Coast, um, these are nine to five people. The sort of rich people who live in um, the Village um, or in uh, I don't even know or in Brownstone, Brooklyn, I guess. I think they work a little bit later. So they get in later, they get out later. Um, in, in Boston, this would be called Cambridge. Um, for example, just because I know a lot of people like that. Um, I don't know how biotech works, um, whether biotech is trad hours or tech hours. Um, but the point is that because there's, um, and, and, and here's the thing, these kind of jobs generate a lot of two-body problems, or academia. Academia generates a lot of two-body problems because, yeah, in tech, it's easy, right? I mean, if you're, the sort of coder who would get a high-end tech job, you can transfer. I mean, you can say, oh, uh, yeah, I was looking to work in New York, but, oh, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm getting a partner who lives in Boston. Can I, um, Let's try to move myself from the Google office in New York to the Google office in Boston. That's not difficult. 
or if it's not Google, but it may be a firm that doesn't have offices in both cities, you can take like your, your years of experience working for a high-end tech firm here, apply for a job here. Your years of experience will get you the interview. Um, and um, the, probably the tech um, interview, the, the whiteboarding interview, will probably be pretty similar. I mean, might be small differences, but it's going to be similar enough that if you manage to get this one, you will get this one. So you're actually pretty mobile in tech um, and in biotech. In academia, however, yeah, no. Um, so in academia, so so people who can't so easily move um, um, in academia because of maybe academia or because of issues of maybe they work in government. So uh, yeah, this. Um, so I think government is actually nine to five, but academia very much is not. Now there are parents in academia who try to keep nine to five hours because of children, but. If you actually need to be at the department, no, you don't need to be there at nine in the morning unless you have a nine in the morning class. Maybe you do, but most often you don't. Okay, these are all people who, are gonna, who have a full day, full day schedule of teaching. Um, four classes per semester is a very teaching heavy, uh, uh, it's, very, it's a very teaching heavy uh, duty, so it's called 4 4 because it's uh, for the first semester of the year, for the second semester of the year. Um, you're, you, you can do 4 I mean, 4 4 is likely you're going to get in the morning, but even that is not guaranteed. And in research academia, the norm is 2 2. So, two classes per semester that you teach. And yeah, you can absolutely uh, do things like schedule them to be, uh, if you're commuting long distance, you're probably going to schedule them to be on the same day. Um, it's, a, it's a very common thing that professors do uh, to, to reduce commuting load. Um, and yeah, you're going for seminars, but seminars aren't going to be in the morning because um, uh, because if you want a grad student to ever show up to your seminar, and you do want the grad students to show up to the seminar, nine in the morning, probably not the best time for it. Try four in the afternoon, and then the, you can take the speaker to dinner afterward. So, so things like that, these are very non-peaky kinds of travel. And the thing is that um, the kind of interstate trips um, that the Northeast Carter would have would have them. So this makes everything so much smoother. You don't need to plan peaks. You're going to have extremely high rolling stock utilization because you can do a really boring thing where the train goes Washington, Boston, Washington, Boston, Washington, and then whenever, and then when the day ends, it just parks wherever you want. Maybe at the ends, maybe you can, uh, maybe it goes out of service in New York, Philly, whatever. Um, but it's actually much easier. And yeah, you want people to ride these trains because these trains have so much utilization that there's spare, that they can take a peak surge. Commuter trains, you don't want there to be a peak surge because you secretly want to reduce peak service as much as possible to avoid getting, to, to avoid buying trains and um, hiring crew that are only useful um, two hours in the morning every day um, at best and two hours in the afternoon every day at best, sorry, every weekday. Um, so, so that's not going to be a problem, okay? So, um, so, um, but, so I think taking out two trains for this is not going to be a problem, but it's something that you need to think about a lot. I mean, look, look how, how long I've been talking about this. And yeah, I can be distracted, but I mean, this is still pretty a, a pretty important thing to um, to look at. Um, so the question is: Is gateway does gateway exist? Um, what else exists? Because gateway, the thing you can do with gateway is essentially. Um, this is not going to look good because um, I'm not showing you very well what the three-line system is. Um, so I'm just going to um, show you the six-line tray on this one and explain. Um, if, so assume that only lines 1, 2, and 3 exist. Remember, 1 pre-exists, 2 is just gateway, and let's say gateway to Grand Central. 3 is uh, not really going to be involved in Trans Hudson, in, in Trans -Hudson thing. Um, so yeah, this is a tunnel, but this is a short tunnel. Um, yeah, plus an end fill, whatever. Not for, not relevant to this kind of timetabling question. Um, so assume it's only these lines. So line four does not exist. Line five does not exist. Line six is just um, trains terminating at a side axis. So what changes? So if this is a stub end, then some trains, I imagine these ones stub end, and then these, and then this one, the Babylon branch goes uh, on line three. Um, so you're doing probably 10 minutes, 10 minutes, 5 minutes, um, and only later can you do 5 minutes, 5 minutes, which is ridiculously frequent service 
with this land use, it's mostly on the strength of assuming a lot of POD, um, plus a lot more development. Not, not, not development of real estate, maybe that too, but development of traffic in the city as well. Um, and then um, on this side, there are these kind of dopey plans to, uh, they're, they're included in Gateway. I mean, not to the 10 billion price tag, but as extras that are supposed to be part of the broader project that take this line, which currently goes, the way the line currently goes is until it's here. I think they they do this curve and then into Hoboken, where they terminate on the surface. You can even see the rail yard. Um, and the plan, and what I'm saying is just leave it as it is until the time comes for line five to do this. What they're planning is to build this loop, the Bergen loop. Um, and you might notice that this area is um, th this area is undeveloped. This is this is a wetland, um, and and people tell me that this wetland is is ecologically sensitive. Whenever I suggest that they put housing here, right next to uh, a station that's literally one kilometer stop, oh, one kilometer stop away from Manhattan. Again, this station does not exist. This is me proposing info, um, but apparently. It's not good enough to be disturbed by housing, but it is good enough to be disturbed by um, by this kind of dopey loop that goes like this. Um, Bergen loop, Sikakov loop, I'm forgetting. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, and it's a Jersey City style building. Jersey City is an extremely envy place. Um, and um, I think Jersey City built something like three times the housing per capita of the city or the metro area on average. Um, because the city is very NIMBY, most of Jersey is on the spectrum between city NIMBY and uh, Jersey City NIMBY, and then the New York side suburbs, so Western Long Island, are even worse than the city. Um, so, at any rate, um, so this and this is with dual mode locomotives because they are planning to spend all this, all this money and still not electrify these lines. So this is kind of bullshit. So what they should be doing if it's a three line system is maybe don't even bother running service on this until you can connect it to something more interesting. It's called the Northern Branch. Um, this is like an actual plan. It's just They don't really have anything useful to connect it to. Like it's a light, they're proposing to connect it to a light rail that kind of went its way to downtown Jersey City not very fast. Um, and uh, so the, this stays outside the system. The, uh, these lines, the Atlantic branch line, stay here. Um, Montauk is part of line three. Maybe Montauk is actually the one that, that connects to Westchester and after, uh, down to, to, Hudson, to the Hudson line here. Um, although you can also see a case for it being the one that Turns uh, at the yard and then the and then these are and, and then these lines go through after. Um, and uh, Staten Island stays where it is, so with a slow ferry connection. And then the question is, what about this? Um, even with a five line system, you need to ask, what about this? And I think the way it should be done, and I'm open to suggestion otherwise, but this is something again needs to be included as a plan. Because planning is not crayon. Planning has to look a lot, a lot of scenarios. Planning is essentially producing many crayons, crayons of crayons of both the map and the surface, and asking uh, which of them is the best. Um, and uh, so, what I think is the correct way to do it, if gateway is built, which is very plausible that it will be built, um, probably better than even odds, I think, of it happening. Um, Grand Central, unfortunately, it, it's still very plausible, but I'm, I'm giving it worse than even odds, which makes me sad. Uh, the rest, unfortunately, is kind of speculative. Um, but um, so if there's this kind of line two system, um, and, and let's put line three aside for a sec, then um, what do you do? Um, and again, my, my guess is the best is this is green. These are green, so Mars and Essex lines kind of become part of their own system. And uh, this is um, this is the Raritan Valley line, which heads into downtown Newark. So maybe it's not the best to create as if it's a branch of this, but it's pretty well segregated from this. And the main problem is this is like this connection. It's called Hunter 
it's, it's called Hunter Interlocking, is flat, though, make it a flying junction. The flyers of New Jersey Transit actually know that they need that. They're proposing that just not being officially crayon for reasons that I cannot tell if it's high construction costs or politicians are being dumb or likely both. Um, and um, so this means that if there's gateway, then yeah, you don't have Mars and SX and you don't have the Carney connection to deal with, um, to, um, to, uh, to deal with um, high speed trains anymore, but you still need to figure out how 24 trains per hour, I don't think you can do 30 Lake Munich with so much ground time. Um, enter. So this is probably trains from here, here, and intercity. Um, there are 30 minutes gaps on the Hudson Bergen light rail. What? Okay. You need wetlands credits for any inch you, for every inch you build. Are they insane? Like they they understand that the value of the wetland is whether it has endangered ecosystems, and therefore, if you disturb one endangered ecosystem, it does not matter whether you're like. I mean, if if I'm gonna go around um, shooting endangered pandas, and I'm not mean I don't mean at the zoo. Um, I, I mean if I'm gonna go around Sichuan with like. Uh, uh, with like a machine gun and like uh, shoot endangered pandas and uh, sell them as trophies and saying that it's uh, okay because I'm spending the money on saving uh, endangered dolphins elsewhere. Like, do you th even if it's endangered dolphins that are native to China as well, do you think the PRC uh, is going to give me credit or do you think it's going to uh, um, dig through my uh, general opinions of that country um, while it throws me in jail for the rest of my life uh, and, uh, and, and uh, blame it on Taiwan somehow. Yes, Sheffield's tram train is on half hour headways and this is dumb. The size of Sheffield, the size of New York, even the Jersey side of New York, okay? Like the um, Jersey side of New York, of the New York metro area has about 6 million people in it, which, so, so imagine Manchester, like greater Manchester and greater Birmingham, like stacked one on top of the other. Um, and also imagine that greater Manchester and greater and greater Birmingham had like high school, like high pay high school jobs. Oh, Aldine's is, oh, okay. Oh, they are, oh, it's already in the plan to um, make these flying junctions. Yay. I knew that the planners wanted, I didn't know, I didn't know it was actually being enacted. Nice. Um, so, so, so rather than proposing things, again, it depends, even like levels of what else is being built, you need to do timetables for all of that. And then you need to ask yourself all these questions, like, um, which trains go into the old tunnels, which trains go into the new tunnel? Um, so I believe it's pretty ironclad that, um, intercity trains should go into the old tunnels because, um, you don't want intercity trains going through Grand Theft going through Grand Central and mocking more commuter trains, um, because this is going to be pretty slow. Um, it's it's kind of weird, because this is a shorter line by distance than this one, but this also has so much freight traffic, not freight, slow passenger, uh, slow commuter traffic that you can't run as fast, and these are annoying curves. It's harder to straighten them. Um, even when you completely alleviate the problems with the bumper tracks, this is not fast. And worst of all, Harlem is a four-track station. There are no bypass tracks. Building the bypass tracks is going to be incredibly difficult, not just because you need to knock down these two buildings, but also because um, timetabling around it. I mean, bypass tracks are not magic. Bypass tracks essentially mean that you're converting a, an express lot from being behind a local to being ahead of a local. So you still need these free slots. And this is not a place with a lot of free slots. Um, even when Penn Station access opens. And so it's delicate, and I think that there's a strong case. I mean, it should still be modeled, but I, think, but I think there's a case that intercities just go in the old tunnels like this. But other questions arise, like, um, okay, so um, again, again, let's pretend that we have the three-line system or something, or the five-line system, so there's no purple in Jersey. So um, if, we, if we freeze the colors to mean 
um, city route. So red forever means this route and green forever means this route. Um, am I right in saying that I'm saying that this should be green and green and these should be red? Or maybe these should be green and these should be red? Maybe the idea is to like spread the paint around so the commuter trains on the northeast corridor don't share tracks through the tunnel with intercity trains. Um, and these trains do. Um, so there's a constraint here and a constraint here, but just one constraint for each and not two constraints. Um, so this is um, so this is the kind of timetable crayon. Um, but 125th can stay a stop. Yes, I don't think it's a. It should be a stop for intercity trains. I mean, it's a lot of things, but it's not Z coins. Um, and and like the more stops you're adding in the city, the more you're slowing down people through. I mean, even Z like Z coins just because it's not. So 125th would connect to Second Avenue subway, and maybe 125th cross down if that ever opens. Z coins connects to the ring, and the ring is just much more important. Um, relatively speaking, I mean, I won't say relatively speaking, not just relatively speaking, the ring is just extremely busy, and, like, the Z-Bling is not very well connected with half pump at all. Um, so, um, whereas if you reopen the passageway between Penn Station and Herald Square, um, yeah, that, that's your connection from Second Avenue Subway to Penn Station. Um... Yeah, yeah, so don't build the bypass, but it does mean that you're slowing the intercities and essentially you're forcing the intercities to use the existing tunnel. Um, so there is the issue that the existing tunnel also has, um, it's also very narrow, which means that there's going to be a uh, difficulty moving all the air around at higher speed. The current tunnels are limited to 60 miles an hour. Um, you can bump them to like 100, 100 something miles an hour, like 160 kilometers an hour or something. Um, but that requires the, so this is something that can be done actually more easily on intercity trains because the intercity trains are going to be high speed trains with shaped noses for um, 300 kilometers an hour, 360 kilometers an hour. So they might, so they might actually be able to go through a tunnel, not at 300, there's there such a narrow tunnel, but it's at a higher speed. So that is something you need to investigate. Um, and I'm assuming that you can, because I know that the Shinkansen achieve Greater phases, so maybe tunnels that are not as cramped but are still pretty cramped at very high at very high relative speeds. The Shinkansen does single bore tunnels for high speed trains, not to, not twin bores. So the trains do pass in the tunnel, um, and uh, so the so, so something about about pressurization. It's it does get, it's again worth investigating, um, and again this is how planning is occurring. Planning needs to ask these questions and produce lots of different crayon scenarios. So let's do a scenario, so, so we can do scenarios like, the question is like, what through runs with what? Um, the way I drew this crayon, so again with line six already, so this, um, is that red runs local, so, uh, so this is a green stop, river line, because it's in the no tunnel, but other than that, um, um, because Penn Station access has to feed into the old tunnel. The old tunnel takes locals on the Jersey side, and the express trains. It's, it's kind of weird. There's there are a bunch of local only stops, and then there's an express only stop. Again, it's it's things that it's worth asking what you're doing, why you're doing that. So the reason this is an express and not a local stop is the um, intercities need to be in the old tunnel, I believe, and um, so. You cannot do a stop in the tunnel if it is used by intercities because that's just going to delay the intercities. Um, so, like these kinds of questions. Um, but maybe not. Maybe yeah, you have a bunch of local like trains running local through Penn Station access, but then they run express on the Jersey side. That's perfectly valid. Yeah, uh, yeah. The TGV, the, the TGV is also uh, pressurized. Um, I believe the Shinkansen is supposed to be more strongly pressurized, but um, you, I don't think you need Shinkansen pressurization because we're not talking about running very fast. We're talking running 160 kilometers an hour with a blockage ratio of 50%, which is not nothing. I mean, the normal blockage ratio on a high-speed rail tunnel is like 10, is not 10, maybe 15%. Um, but again, it's 15% at 300 
50 kilometers an hour or something. This is 160. Um, and the impact of... So in, in theory, the impact of air resistance on... Uh, uh, on the train, uh, like uh, uh, on train resistance, is like um, uh, on, on traction resistance is quadratic, but on noise it's more than quadratic. Um, I think it's I want to say it's cubic maybe. Um, and, it, it, and it's also quadratic per unit of uh, distance, uh, not time, because as a, as, as a unit of uh, so so it's cubic, I guess, so it means it's cubic in units of time. You're just going to spend less time at higher speed than lower speed if you're, because if you're running faster, you get there faster, um, is the trade-off. Um, so, um, uh, so, so, so the issue is that um, you need to ask yourself all of these questions. And this is, so, um, so, I'm kind of motivating the things to do um, when I actually don't just do endless analysis, but do a little bit of synthesis, which I promise I will do tonight. Um, and so I want something that has kind of some kind of Northeast Carter connection, so either the Connecticut side or the Jersey side, um, just for the interplay between how uh, intercity and regional trains work. Um, there need to be a bunch of scenarios, but we can't reliably look at all of them, not in one evening. This is what I'm getting paid to do as TCP wraps up. Um, it's supposed to be a two-year project. Uh, and um, then l generate scenarios and see what works. Um, so as I said, I'm violating a lot of sacrosanct American planning assumptions like that, you, that at any point Planning for each agency should assume that all of the. Uh, oh, oh, yeah, okay, that, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, one of the sacrosanct principles, unfortunately, of American rail planning is that every railroad using a piece of infrastructure must assume that the other railroads using the same piece of infrastructure um, are run by baboons. Mm -hmm. Um, but by, people, by, by, by intelligent baboons, except they use all of their extra endpoints on top of the usual intelligence uh, score of the baboon just to think how to screw you over. Um, this is kind of the assumption, and it's an assumption that has some basis in reality, that is to say the freight railroads. Um, I'm going to say they are run by baboons, but the planning for but. The, the planning based on freight principles for passenger rail purposes is kind of uh, um, like something that I saw at the beginning of this month um, at the Berlin Zoo. Um, and, to, and to make it very clear, I don't mean the tourists. And so, yeah, it can be looked at with automation. Yeah, you can absolutely um, you, you can absolutely um, do this by um, software. Uh, and one of the things we're looking at is how to automate this because this is non-trivial. Um, and bear in mind, in Switzerland, they're only now computerizing their planning. They're and traditionally they did hand planning in Switzerland. And I don't mean traditionally in the 1970s. I mean traditionally in the 2010s. Um. Anyway, so um. The, so one of the assumptions is the assumption of baboons, which is a very bad assumption when it's a bunch of passenger rail authorities, all of which, first of all, have the same set of managers moving between them, just fire them all. Second is when they're all getting grants from the exact same organization, that is to say the federal government, without which they would instantly collapse. Third, when the planning on this is already in theory coordinated in NEC future and they're still making the baboon assumption so they're asking the MBTA what do you guys want get the Amtrak out of our way they're asking Amtrak what do you guys want get the MBTA out of our way okay let's separate them at both I mean, I mean not, not that they, it of course is huge relative to relative to what they need but it's hundreds of millions not tens of billions um Amtrak what do you want out of Metro North Get these baboons out of our way. Metro North, what do you want out of Amtrak? Get these baboons out of our way. And, and like, these become billions. These become tens of billions. Just on 
just not doing coordinated planning. So this is a, an assumption that I'm just uh, that, that I'm just uh, using um, to like burn things because it's supposed to be an energy crisis here or something come winter. I mean, I don't care actually. I, I have passive, I have good passive solar design. I don't really need heating, but I'm um, like give it like, like like give the like maybe order paper with these kinds of assumptions written down on it for for the benefits of friends who don't need something to burn from December. Um, another is the assumption that you uh, can't mess up with NIMBYs in uh, Fairfield County. Now, this is not a NIMBY plan. This is just literally within right of way. This gives them better commuter trains to uh, uh, their Manhattan jobs. I mean, this is not something they're going to resist. And there's even things that they demand that can actually be accommodated very easily. Like, the apparently, this line, the New Canaan branch, has great crossings. The great crossings don't have quad gates. Um, the rule in the United States is that um, at a normie grade crossing, first of all, there's a 90 mile an hour speed limit, or more importantly, um, whenever the train goes, it needs to blare its horn very loudly. Uh, I believe there was a study that said that it would save five lives a year nationwide about 20 years ago, 25 years ago. Um, now, a municipality is allowed to declare a quiet zone, but only if there are quad gates. Quad gates means, uh, the, the meaning of a quad gate is that instead of just barriers coming down on the right half of the road, the, the one that the cars drive on, it's also going to come on the left so that cars can't drive around. Uh, the installation costs of quad gates are, I'm not going to say they're five cents. They're not five cents. I believe they're $500,000. Um but it's not that there's one every meter. It's five hundred thousand dollars every, not even every block. It's like in very poorly built areas, maybe a couple to a mile. I mean, it's usually less than that. So yeah, it's construction costs that are going to be, um, for all intents and purposes, a rounding hour. Uh, so you can give this to the to the nice white fighters of New Canaan. And they will be happy. And yes, it means, and yeah, maybe in the last 20 minutes of the um, trip from New Canaan to their midtown Manhattan job, the train's going to have more black people than they're used to. But I mean, these people are racist, but they're not that racist. Okay? I mean, there's, there's levels of racism, and these people, honestly, even Darian at this point, are not, you know, proud boys. Um, and I'm saying Darian are not proud boys. Literally, Trump and the Proud Boys and such are what made Darian stop being a Republican. Literally, Darian voted against um, LBJ. Like, Darian, literally, before before Donald Trump, Darian Connecticut, the most Democrat, the, the most Democratic it had ever voted was, I believe, Republican plus nine in 1964. Clinton won it. Biden won it. Um, so, again, so I'm not saying these people are not racist just because they're rich. They're racist. They're very racist. They're very nimby. Um, but I think at this distance, um, again, black people on the train last 20 minutes, they aren't going to like it, but balanced against other things, I think it's going to, I think they're going to be okay with it. The problem, however, is that, um, look at this line. Okay. I'm pretty sure I mentioned this before. Why not does, uh, MTA not simply eat puny Metro North and LIR? Uh, there were even plans to merge Metro North and LIR as a uh, department of, uh, commuter rail or something, MTA commuter rail. Um, NIMBYs on both sides said no. And by NIMBYs, I don't, not necessarily NIMBYs isn't, isn't housing NIMBYs, but people with these kinds of politics who believe that their suburb is special, like the same kind of Long Islanders who were against Penn Station access, their, co their equivalent numbers of the Metro North side. Local, very petty local politicians was like main uh, selling point was that they do this kind of what you in Britain would call casework. Uh, in the US, I don't think there's a term for that. It's just how a legislator is expected to behave when there's no ideological difference in the legislator. In the legislature, these were supposed to be intractable. And again, um, these, like on the, the, the Long Island, on the Long Island side, they're also opposed to station access and then one incompetent manager ceased to be employed and they all uh, shut the hell up. And I don't mean the manager shut the hell up, I mean the polit like politicians who Cuomo was semi-reliant on shut the hell up. I mean, like their job was like, like yeah. 
Um, and so, oh yeah, I mean, a lot of coordination, yeah, yeah, so stuff like the Harold interlocking, I mean, but a lot of it, but even the Harold interlocking, honestly, depends on what kind of service you want to run. There are service plans that I don't think are optimal with Harold, but service plans that could be generated that are, that do not require Harold. I mean, Harold's happening. But, um, so anyway, um, I bring this up because, um, Another assumption is that you can't ruffle feathers with NIMBYs, um, specifically in Fairfield County. It was always was an informal planning assumption when I never remember if it was ACOM or if I think it was ACOM that um, generated some of these uh, scenarios. Um, what you should be doing is going roughly along I-95, shaving a little bit of private property, but it's next to a freeway, um, and then go from about here to here direct. This, first of all, shaves private property. Second, um, shaves it very brazenly. I mean, so it's maybe a couple things behind these offices. Even shaves offices, I think. I think these cost more to remove than these. Um, and then this. It's just very, it's not, I mean, it's not, Objectively speaking, it's not a lot of eminent domain. I'm guessing it's 100 houses all in all, but it's very brazen in the sense it's just carved in the right of way. And so planners gag yeah, at the idea. And it's not just politicians, it's planners who like were told that eminent domain is Robert knows this, especially if it is eminent domain uh, in Darien, a group that Robert knows this notoriously uh, uh, disenfranchised uh, in all of its plans in order to transfer their um, hard. Uh, earned money to the people of Harlem or, or something. So um, the uh, so so planners rested the idea of doing. They understand that they need to do eminent domain. They do do it, but they do it very gradually. So why highway widening that shaves a few things near the highway that they will do, but carving no right of way, they think cannot be done. Bullshit! It can be done. Um, my reading is that there's not going to be. My, my reading of this, based on some political knowledge, although admittedly not a lot of political knowledge. Um, but I mean, but not being a pure layperson or a pure generalist here, and my, my reading is that if this happens, people are going to complain, but it's going to happen. The idea is you do this cord and then you go back around I-95. Um, um, and then, uh, so that's another sacrosanct planning assumption that I'm violating about, um, informal power, NIMBYs. Um, like, I mean, it is, again, I mean, accommodate reasonable requests, okay? I mean, the, the fact that these are not quad gates is a travesty, but quad gates, you won't notice the money. Um, there are a bunch of NIMBYs, um, not, not here, here, um, Old Saber and uh, Old Lime, and, and I actually talked to one of them, one of them paid me to um, do some analysis, not here, but um, in Southwest Canada, okay? Um, and I looked also here, not, not for money or anything, just out of curiosity, they have, I think, three demands. Um, um, they complain that the Northeast Carter future process is going to reduce their quality of life or something, something for three reasons. The first is uh, the current plans um, are to actually use this legacy line here and only transition to I-95 here because only here does the line get really curvy, and I think it's bullshit to think they need to transition to New Haven, not Old Saybrook. So the complaint is that this is environmentally sensitive. I have no idea if it is. I don't know if they do either. Um, second is the line somehow goes on the south side of I-95, so there's going to be some noise in the historic center of old line here. And the third is that this is going to um, claw parts of their marina, of their beloved marina. For which the, reason, the answer to number one is just do it right. To number three, stay on the north side. Number two, yeah, that is not something that can be accommodated, and then the answer is pick better hobbies. But um, but again, the, po the, the point is not to like specifically screw with NIMBYs because it's fun. I mean, it might be, but I mean, I do other things for fun. The point is to just build good infrastructure and not cause and, and like I mean, tell, again, so you tell people to get better hobbies when the cost of accommodating is a tunnel. You don't tell people to get better hobbies when the cost of accommodating is moving the bridge to another side of a freeway, if that makes sense. Well, how did the LRF third truck, oh, because of the, because of assumptions, because of NIMBYs, I mean, 
the NIMBYs, I guess the issue with the NIMBYs is they also um, said that more traffic would reduce their quality of life or some horrifically selfish bullshit um, by Long Islanders, aka people who's, who owe their entire existence to trains to New York. Um, but anyway, so the point is that some of these complaints can be accommodated, some of them can't, but my understanding is that federal, like actual federal planners and like honestly maybe even state planners don't care enough. Um, I mean, maybe not sort of state planners who are like sitting in an office nobody has heard of and like can't do anything unless a political appointee signs off, but federal planning is a little bit more proactive um, sometimes. Um, certainly the federal politicians seriously don't give a shit about this. I mean, I'm not saying they don't give a shit about their answer when you could nuke it, but 100 houses, I think, is doable. So bring all this up because it means that when we plan this, and again, the, the plan is going to be one side of the, the synthetic plan, I swear I'm about to start, is going to be one side of the Northeast Carter, and I'm not sure whether it's the Jersey side or the Connecticut side, but um, I'm tempted. Oh, this, yeah. No, usually they do. Um, usually they do eminent domain in the shaving hill a few yards. That is something that is being done. For example, it was part of the part uh, part of the plan for quad tracking Caltrain, the Caltrain corridor for high speed rail. Um, what they don't like doing is carve new right of way very brazenly. So I have this constant criticism of high speed rail, which is very far from the worst thing about it. I wish it were the worst thing about it. Where what they should have done was um, realize that. Um, there's no good right of way to go through the Central Valley. There are two railways. There's BNSF and there is UP. But the problem is that they're great and they pass through all these little towns um, that uh, are not served. So I, I said at the beginning of this video that Americans outside New England didn't live in villages and Europeans did. Um, these are not villages. These are small towns. These are like little railroad towns. It's not so... Um, uh, no, not farm, not not farm households. The farms were were separate, as you, as you can see with the, with the squares. Um, and so, um, the idea was so they said, oh, we don't need eminent domain. We can just follow either UP or BNSF. Um, and then they realized, oh shit, these lines go at grade through little towns. They're never going to get service, and they're going to do so at 350 kilometers an hour. And if you want to grade separate them, first it's money. Second, you're literally putting a 350 kilometer an hour through a little town center. Um, and they realized, oh shit, what they should have done was realize the oh shit before um, they started construction. So they, they should have realized that oh shit in 2005 and then just already then, crayon maybe going through Bakersfield because it has served, and then from there, just a west of 99. So west of Delano, west of Tulare, like maybe you do a Beachfield station between Hanford and Visalia. Um, then either you converge back to Fresno or you go west of Fresno because um, the uh, because downtown Fresno is here and the kind of not quite beat field but like tangent to the urban area station would be relatively close, like around here or something. Um, and then go back to um, strategically carving right of work through farmland, but they didn't want to carve right of work through farmland because it was to it, it would look very brazen on a map, but they absolutely did do they absolutely did do this kind of um, eminent domain if it didn't look if it was just little corrections that wouldn't be visible. Yeah, uh, the problems are the north end, but they're not. Um, the big problems are north end, um, south end. There are problems on the south end. It's just that the problems are easier to solve because it's something like a uh, curve between two fast segments. And uh, in Connecticut, maybe it's also curves like that, but there's more of them. Um, so I'm not going to do high speed rail planning for this because I did say commuter rail. Um, but I'm kind of tempted to do the Connecticut side. So New York to New Haven and a acknowledge that I am cheating a little bit because I have done New York and Haven already. Um, this. Um, this, if anything, argues for maybe doing the New Jersey side, right? Um, like, I, I, I mean, I could revise this. Um, this post. But maybe I should not be revising this post and instead I should be... Um, 
doing something about New York to Toronto. And it's just in New York to Toronto, like, as I said, you need to think a lot about the... Uh, also, I need to edit this both because I somehow when I copy pasted this, notice how uh, subheads should be in, that should be in bold or not. Anyway, so actually, let's do the Jersey side. Okay, so um, let so I do have um a what is it MJ speed limit MJT speed limits. Also, I don't like working in Excel because it's, I mean, I export things there, but I actually work in ODS, so. Uh, and you might notice that I haven't touched it in a while. So, we should probably do Northeast Harder and New Jersey Coastline, and then try to figure out how they connect with other things. But again, it's going to be a lot more delicate than that. So, um, this is all, by the way, in kilometers an hour. Um, so I'm assuming 50 kilometers an hour and the interlocking right now, it's 15 miles an hour. So 25 kilometers an hour, you get the factor of square root of two free, uh, uh, for, um, for free, just from modernizing the, the interlockings, but, and the same, but just making them tangential and not secant. But even then you can squeeze a little bit more essentially cutting, the, I think maybe cutting the radius by a little bit just by having curved frogs. Um, and then because the trains are going to sway less, even with higher plant efficiency, you can use a higher number interlocking. And of course, for intercity trains, you can just make sure that they take the straight side. Um, the speed up to 80 assumes certain things about... Uh, um, so... Uh, assume this rebuild of brand section. So let's actually assume, let's do this assumption. Okay? The assumption is that um, brand station is not going to be significantly rebuilt. Um, I'm not going to do it Erie because Erie does not interact with um, intercity trains and you do want something that interacts with intercity trains. So um, I'm not doing a speed up to uh, uh, 160 through the tunnel. And this is because I am worried about the blockage ratio. Um, I can see a case for like 120, 130, but not 160. I'm getting squeamish. Um, so the portal bridge, um, and then it's just a pretty straight line. Um, little curves, but uh, so the port. So when I'm saying the portal bridge limit is not geometric, the portal bridge imposes a speed limit. But the speed limit, when I'm saying it's not geometric, I mean it comes from the fact that it's a uh, it's a movable bridge, and uh, I don't know to what extent it's a real speed limit, and what of it is how much of it is just safety theater, just imposed speed limits because it appears safer. But a lot of the issue comes from uh, dynamical axle load. So if you just use lighter trains, that alleviates a lot of that. So I'm being agnostic about whether that bridge is even being rebuilt because I I think it should probably be rebuilt for maintenance reasons, but I don't think that. The speed limit um, makes sense um, for better for better trains. Um, this is just before Penn, um, even before Newark Penn, uh, the, the curved Titans. Essentially, from there onward, the entirety is 160 kilometers an hour. Now, I'm seeing what you're saying. If, if you know if you know the area, there's an S curve at Elizabeth. Um, so Elizabeth has an S curve. Uh, is here. Uh, the S-curve, I'm forgetting what it's limited to, I think. I want to say 90 kilometers an hour, but this is, I believe it's limited to maybe that, but I think it might not be overly conservative. But also, um, so, so I believe that if you keep it as it is, it's about, um, and you super elevate properly, it's much more than that. And more importantly, uh, this is a station, and probably all trains should be stopping here. Um, there's kind of a tendency to express service that just in American commuter rail that skips a lot of important stops. And I think that this is a bad idea. So, for example, the way it works on intercity trains is the trains go New York, New Rochelle, Stanford, uh, Bridgeport, New Haven. Um, 
you would expect maybe that the most express Metro North trains would still make these stops, right? But no, the even the even very standard express trains that go from past Stanford to Grand Central, all of them go non-stop from Stanford to Harlem. So no New Rochelle stop. Uh, I do not know whether that is planned to change for Penn Station access. If they don't change that, then they're stupid because this is the reverse branch point. You want all the express trains to stop here so that someone riding an express train can change maybe to a local train to the other destination. So if it's an express train to Grand Central, change to a local to Penn Station. Uh, maybe other way around. But, right? I mean, maybe if they want to run express trains into Penn Station and change to a local to Grand Central, whatever. Either way. Do I have a formula or a script that allows to calculate the length necessary for an S-curve given the need to limit the jerk? Uh, yes. So, um, yeah, then rebuild the station. I mean, you need to be rebuilding the, uh, I mean, you need to be rebuilding the, uh, you need to be rebuilding shell interlocking anyway. Um, so the entire length. Okay, so, um, for an S curve, here's the trick. Um, the trick is that using even 20th century engineering, let alone 21st, you can do perfect S curves, which means you. So there's kind of tendency in America to hate S curves, so you all, all so you always want little straight segments in between, which is perfect. You fold the straight segment into your S. So here's what you do. Okay, um, we can. So first of all, there's something called super elevation spiral, and all no, and also can efficiency spiral. But I think the super elevation spiral is the one that controls. Um, the best standards that I know are the Swedish one. So this is marked in Lindahl's thesis, which uh, I which was on the internet for many years and appears to have link on it. And unfortunately, Lindahl is one of the most common Swedish last. Yeah, um, so this is, no, 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 let me see that after having loaded this, I've already downloaded the entire download. I am not a robot. No, I don't want cookies. Actually, I do want cookies. While we're waiting, um, this is a thesis from KTH from I think maybe seven six or something um, that investigates the possibility of doing high speed tilting trains um, to avoid having to build uh, to avoid having to build um, expensive dedicated high speed tracks in Sweden, which is a not very densely populated country for that um, and concluded it was technically feasible um, it didn't happen during that, I mean it was, like, during that, uh, it was one of many things that was investigated as part of the uh, uh, green train plan to improve rail in Sweden I mean again it didn't happen but it's very it's a very good survey Hmm. It's under 2006, 2001, sorry. So, um, so this is, so B is what we're looking for. Um, so the permissible Kant efficiency is 150. Um, 
on a non tilting crane. We can squeeze about 180. They're saying 245. 180 with active suspension, 245 is with a full active tilting system, and these are kind of a technical dead end. Um, they turn out to be, um, they, they turn to cause motion sickness, um, and they have very high R maintenance costs to the point that they're being discontinued. In most of Europe, but 180 is passive tilt like Talgo or active suspension like Shikansa, and that's a thing. Um, so you're asking about super elevation ramp and transition. So the maximum rate of change of cant and cant efficiency is 55 millimeters per second. Um, so you need, so if you have 150 millimeters cant efficiency, it's a little less than three seconds. Now, maximum cant is uh, actually you can go a little more than 100. So I usually do 150 when I am doing, uh, oh, sorry, borders. So which country is a conventional separate dedicated high speed rail bad fit for? Israel. Um, New Zealand. I mean, you're asking me about developed countries, right? Because I mean, it's good in Japan, South Korea, Taiwan. In Canada, I mean, I don't think it's like a oh my god, build, build, build thing um, between Toronto and Montreal, but it's useful. In Australia, same thing. I don't think it's build, build, build. It's certainly not at like Australian construction costs, but it's like normal construction costs. Yeah, they can do Brisbane to Sydney to Melbourne. Um, then the UK, I mean, the UK is somehow managing to make it work even at British costs. Then the US, yeah, it needs that. Continental Europe, I mean, everything, it's like one system. And then I guess what's left is what, Ireland or something? So anyway, when we're doing, um, we're, we're talking about um, spiraling. Um, absolute maximum cant is 200 millimeters on the Shinkansen. Um, this is something that you do when you're absolutely sure trains were never gonna, trains were never gonna stop on this. Um, which you can do if you have very reliable passenger trains, you can't do it on mixed lines, but it's fine, we're not gonna do mixed lines. These are lines that maybe have freight, but we're gonna do the, these are four track lines. This is a four track line. This is a four track line. Freight goes on the local track. Um, so, um, so anyway, um, the maximum change is that um, if it's 200, that it's going to take you almost four seconds uh, to go from zero to full curve. Um, and if that um, now you can argue that these are tilting, that, that even active suspension counts as tilt, and then it's three seconds and not four seconds. Okay, sure. Let's say, let's say three seconds. Um, if it's three seconds, then, um, um, so, so if it takes three seconds, then, um, you should always think of a curve as one and a half seconds of straight line and then the circle. The difference between that and actually drawing the spiral is basically nothing. And if it's an S curve, and by the way, why one and a half and not three? Well, um, half of the spiral is within the curve. Um, and if it's an S curve, then one and a half times two is three again, three not six because half the spiral is within the curve. Um, so it takes um, three seconds to go from tangent to full curve, but again, half of that would be within the curve, and it takes six seconds to go from one from full curve in one direction to full curve in the other direction. Um, so that is the formula. Um, uh, thanks, Marnaki. Um, and this is something that actually can be done with the. Um, so bear, bear with Elizabeth can probably be straightened. Big probably. I mean, I checked it. it can be the problem is they keep they know they don't safeguard in America, so they keep building things the way um it used to be this and they built this um and, and this um and even these are not i mean this is i think a i want to say 50 million dollar building or something um this is a parking garage um this might be able to stay this i'm not sure about the housing project i want to say is about 200 um and you definitely want to avoid leveling that but i don't think you need to um, that's maybe 200 kilometers an hour if you keep it, maybe 220 even. Um, and even then, even with today, with, if you remove the most conservative parts of this, um, 
that's already dead letter. I mean, it's like again, all stop, all trains should be stopping at Elizabeth because it's because it's such an important town center. And then it's something like eight hundred meters, eight hundred meters out of Elizabeth, you're maybe one hundred and twenty kilometers an hour. Um, so this is the dead letter curve for greater train. Um, and then the rest, and this is again, I mean, I mean, metro like the metro park curves here. I mean, yeah, they're annoying, but they're dead letter for commuter train. Um, so, um, these are the speed zones, and I would defend them. Um, so now let's think think about the stop spacing. So, if this is uh, trains that don't share tracks with uh, intercities. Um, then we can also do um, within the tunnel um, Bergen Line Avenue. Uh, and bear in mind also if this is a, it's kind of a delicate thing because um, uh, it, it's kind of annoying. You kind of would want to put the high speed trains in the new tunnels. I mean, if you look at the crayon that I drew, there's a little bit of a note there that at low enough cost, you can just put the trains in a completely separate tunnel. Um, so the, this is kind of this annoying, this kind of, it's kind of a weird pensation crayon where instead of having lines, just one, two, uh, sorry, one, two, and three there, um, you can like maybe have like squeeze, so, so like, I guess six platforms or something. I mean, 12 platform tracks, but six platforms, one for each direction, like each, uh, um, a approach track becomes two station tracks is I think what needs to be done. I have a video about this. Um, then um, instead of that, you can do a weird thing where you have between them, like instead of six platforms, 12 tracks, eight platforms, 16 tracks, and it's a little more cramped, but there's still enough space um, just for high speed trains. Um, and then you high speed trains get their own dedicated tunnels, like here, maybe like under the FDR or something, um, just to relieve this bit of high speed rail track sharing. This is kind of annoying. Um, so, um, Again, lots of things are going to be done. Questions like, can you mine platforms on here? Probably, yes. Um, I don't know how much, like, like how easily you can do it while the train stays in service, but it should be yes. Elizabeth is an Amtrak issue. Yeah, that's fine. I mean, commuter, I mean, remember, the poll point is to do coordinated planning, so I don't want to hear, oh, this is Amtrak, not commuter rail, or this is bus, not rail, or this is another, or, or, or this is... Another department of my agency, when um, run by someone who works, um, literally across the uh, uh, literally across the hallway from me, but I um, don't like the color of their shirt, and therefore, and we're not going to talk. Um, like the whole point is to do this planning correctly, to do this kind of organization before concrete, and again, as, as I keep reminding to people, I'm reminding to people. I hate English. I have to keep reminding people, when I'm saying organization before concrete or electronics before concrete, I don't mean instead of concrete. Look at how much concrete this map proposes, just what you can do when everything else is optimized. Um, and so, um, so let's mod this a little bit, okay? So um, let's say that this is a system that does have the... Um, I don't know if we're gonna say that this should have dedicated tracks, but maybe. Okay, if it, I mean maybe that's too much. That's too easy mode. But let's say that. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna fork this as NJT NEC speed limits. Okay, and um, we're gonna pretend that these don't exist right now. We're gonna rename this. Sh can you can you guys see this? Yes, you can. Uh, yeah, Metro Park, I mean, yeah, and the, and the point is that um, commuter trains should all be stopping there. There's this kind of annoying idea that um, uh, metro that commuter trains should be running nonstop between New Brunswick and Newark, and it's dumb. I mean, if you want to run express, run subway-style express to make the major stops, so it would be things like Metro Park. I also think Elizabeth should be on that list of major stops. Um, and um, so, okay. Um, so I'm going to make the following assumption. Um, 
assumption being um, um, So this is the assumption we're going to work with. Um, so let's say that this is the old and not the new stop. Um, so Penn Station is like this. And then we do want to have this stop. And I'm going to be kind of agnostic about this, whether this is secretly the new tunnel or the old tunnel. Let's say it's the old tunnel. And if it needs to be the new tunnel for until tabling purposes, then sure. OK. So um, we start from 8th Avenue, and the old tunnel is straight, and notionally, the stop is Bergen Line. So this is kilometer point 3.7. Okay. Um, yeah, exactly, exactly. So we're going to run to that point. Um, so we need to insert a new row. Bergen Line. Avenue. Um, speed West is still going to be 200. Um, and it's moving 100. Um, no notes. Um, because it's still the same speed. Um, we're assuming that we're not going to deal with 200 millimeter super elevation, so delete this. Um, we're going to deal with time and such later, so please ignore column E for now. We're just we're just annotating. Um, see, Caucus Junction. Um, let's do separated things. So this is not something that needs to be out of the way of high speed trains. So this is this is a very specific easy mode that I'm playing, or maybe I'm not doing any. Maybe I'm doing a build. Um, right, like I don't remember which character class I said I'm doing. Um. Maybe I said I'm wizard and now I'm rogue. So if I'm doing a rogue, I'm just using this kind of really cool stealth that lets me, um, that's maybe not intended by the dev team, but um, but it's fully straight legal. So, Northman. Now what do we do past Northman? Now, question. What about Manhattan Transfer? So my crown here has it as a station. Um, now this is a very, kind of reject modernity and break tradition, men what's stopping you from living like this kind of uh, name. Um, this is a station that existed. Um, I'm forgetting where this literal location or nearby. Um, when the line to Penn Station had just opened because Penn Station could not take steam power because um, the tunnels were cramped um, and people would die of smoke inhalation. So, they, so at the time, the way it worked was that there were uh, electric locomotives between Penn Station and this place called Manhattan Transfer, which is also where Path was. So and they were not called, it was not called Path, it was called the Hudson Tubes, but the Hudson Tubes went here. You could change trains, um, and it was the transfer to Manhattan. Um, and then on the... Um, and then... Uh, I believe it was also like this. I'm forgetting where the um, change point was. I think Sunnyside. Um, when they said when the line had just opened the New York Connecting Railroad, um, and I want to say maybe 1916, 1917 is when they um, electrified this thing. Uh, they electrified New York. They electrified um, Grand Central to I want to say Wakefield and Highbridge in 1903 or something or 1905, and then. Uh, with the third rail, and then the New Haven Railroad came in and electrified its side of this with catenary to Stanford, the one thing, 1907, and New Haven, 1914. Um, it might have been the longest electrified railroad in the world at the time. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm not sure, but it might have been. Um, yeah, exactly. So, um, so yeah, so when, when it was just the Hudson of Manhattan, um, the idea was that so the station had no street access, so this is kind of a bad spot. And you kind of see that the land use here, and this was a major station. Um, the uh, only this was only closed. I want to say 1933 when they electrified 
all the way in New York to Philly to Washington. Uh, and then they also re and then they also extended the path at the same time to New York. Um, so this kind of reopens Manhattan transfer and the idea, is, and, and this is something that's specifically a six line system point because with the two line system, who cares the land? I mean, you look, look at the land use, just look at the land use, rail yard, freeway. I don't even know what this is. Um, now, if line six opens, to, if kind of line six thing to um, Grand Central opens to Jersey, then suddenly you want to have a transfer between this system and this system. And then what is the best location? Something like Manhattan transfer. And yeah, I know that this is kind of a, a name that is like kind of, again, reject modernity, embrace tradition, men, what's stopping you? Uh, uh, looking like this European men then like uh, these kind of old timey I want to say 1950s happy white family picture except it's not even 1950s it's 1920s uh, but um, the but this I imagine would imply a lot of changes here to uh, make the land use here more conducive for local use of the train because this is literally opening a commuter rail stop that's gonna again I, I'm telling you guys not to look at time but do look at time. We're talking ten minutes to Newark Penn. I mean, and yeah, and the and the stop is going to snipe that. But it's still we're talking something like nine, ten minutes to Penn Station to, to like mid to to Midtown Manhattan from here. Yeah. Uh, the I'm not. I know I'm not. I know I'm streaming this, and I should be streaming video games. But um. Uh. But um. I might want to stream Stray. Yeah, this is what this is roughly what the land use should look like. I mean, maybe not these exact buildings or something, but I mean this kind of stuff. KWCMB. Yeah, exactly. Now, bear in mind it's not currently nine minutes to Manhattan because the trains are slow ass. I think it's like sixteen minutes to Manhattan. Um. Yeah, so they're doing a lot of building on Harrison. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, I'm I'm seeing buildings that are multifamily. Um, look at this. Look especially at this um, uh, lot and this lot and this lot and this lot and this lot. Can you see the amazing DoD? Like, yeah, I get that. Like, it's work in progress. But I mean, I'm seeing like I mean, yeah, I get that these buildings exist, and I'm assuming that they're going to make this entire area look like that eventually. But um. Yeah, also do it here, maybe, if this is the plan. Um, so we should include Manhattan transfer. Now, I do not know what the kilometer point on Manhattan transfer is, but we can soon find out. Uh, and the way I'm going to find out is uh, to do it backward from Newark Pen, because I don't want to do it from New York Pen. So this is two kilometers from Newark Pen. So... 14. Now, bear in mind that this also turns the one. So this is the 110 curve that um, I was mentioning. This is a very tight curve, actually. Um, it, people don't think about it this much because it's right next to North Penn, but this is uh, pretty bad. And uh, so, um, bear in mind that this curve, which is, again is like a 110 curve, you don't want to call it that better. It's almost that letter. Um, so let's do this. Actually, fourteen. Um, the controlling curve is at KP four point five. This is called Manhattan transfer. Um, and again, the times will need to be changed, although way less than you think. Then North Penn. And now, as I said, we need to think about how this works with the buses, with other urban transit, okay? Um, now, New Jersey Transit has bad but better integration of commuter rail into buses and transfers than do the New York side commuter rail agencies, which believe that um, buses are um, for um, a... Uh, for like racially inferior people, but um, in Jersey too, you can ask questions like, okay, is this good at serving the residents of Newark? Remember, S-Bahn systems are urban rail. The Berlin S-Bahn is urban rail. 
the Berlin S-Bahn does go into the suburbs. Um, I believe the only suburban area that is served with frequency is Potsdam, which is basically a neighborhood of Berlin under occupation. Um, I think might actually, I think Potsdam might actually be. No, actually, it's like maybe also Leipzig. I'm pretty sure Potsdam and Leipzig maybe are the only places in historic East Germany that are not in Berlin that where, where the Greens are the number one party or something like that. Um, within Ber within the central part of historic East Berlin, like where I live, the Greens are also the number one party. But um, um, the uh, and, and I don't just mean socially in the same way that oh Austin is like left wing or something. No, I mean like it's also adjacent to Berlin and it's dense. So I mean Germany dense. Um, but yeah, so there's suburban stuff on the S bahn, but the S bahn mostly is used within Berlin. Um, and it's or, so it's partly about how can the system be useful for city residents. It's not a question that's usually asked in American commuter rail planning, which is siloed as only for 9 to 5 suburbanites. And the problem is government workers in the United States have stayed 9 to 5 much longer than their private sector um, white-collar compatriots. And this means that they think, about, and, and, and moreover, the American private sector um, is characterized by very high mobility between firms and between industries. This is part of the American ideology that the generalist is superior to the specialist. But it is also part of a business um, culture in which you get ahead by moving between firms. The way you get raises, you, people who stay in one firm do get raises, but generally you get much better raises if you hop between firms to the point to the point there's even career advice given to um, such um, white collar workers about how to about the optimal duration um, of work for one particular firm because you don't want to be the to get a good reputation as someone who leaves after three months or six months because you do need to learn the, the, the company's internal working somewhat um, so so I believe the minimum is every year but in the optimum is every two years like if every year is if you're really unhappy um, normally you should be moving every two maybe three years um, so this is um, this is really important within American business culture um, and, uh, and again, there are other important aspects of American business culture that are distinct from our own here in Europe. Like that, uh, um, there's much more prestige for starting your own business. Um, conversely, firms are worse at reinventing themselves, um, and this means that often uh, new technology comes from uh, new firms and not established ones. Um, I don't come Tesla a lot. Tesla has safety problems from hell. Um, Tesla, I believe, is the biggest EV manufacturer. In America, I don't. In, I don't. I don't think it's the biggest in the world. I think Builder Dreams is bigger. But, um, uh, but in Europe, the biggest EV firms um, are just established ones. I mean, there there is no Tesla here, and it's not because there's no EVs here. There are EVs here, especially as consumer markets with a lot of EVs, um, especially in Norway. It's just um, a lot of it is something that oh, they figured out how to do VW EVs or how to do or in Japan. Japan is very much a culture that's anti start your own business pro uh just uh there's the salaryman culture where you stay in your own business and every skill your boss needs you to learn you will learn and therefore uh the for and the for, and therefore you will um spend very long hours being whoever the firm needs you to be and so for example toyota and such do uh, um uh, um do their own uh, things. I mean, maybe not EVs, but um, kind of. But remember the invention before EVs there were hybrids. The hybrids were were essentially an invention of Toyota and Honda. So, so we're thinking about it, like uh, like the kind of like the next thing about how to make cars more fuel efficient in the 2000s was the hybrid, and this was something that came out of Japan, out of literally their um, two largest automakers, and then the 2010s there was maybe EVs coming out of the United States, out of an entirely new entrant. Um, so again, American business culture, and my point is that in the public sector, um, some of that still exists because you do see um, often a, a preference for starting new and improved agencies. Um, it's kind of the 15 standard XKCD. Um, this one.
No, uh, so this, um, and there's also the American ideology of the superiority of the generalist to the specialist. Um, something you also see, for example, in the army, uh, in the IDF. Um, here's how you become a tank officer in the IDF. Uh, you go to, I mean, yeah, as I said, Tesla has safety problems from how. So in the IDF, um, if you're an armored, first of all, it's kind of the, it, it's, it's considered the most important combat arm. Also, my father served her, so I know a little bit more about it than about other things. Also, unlike infantry, it's a little more uniform infantry, and the IDF is a regimental system from hell. Um, so um, you do basic training, um, you study, th th then you get split into three, whether you're a gunner, a loader, or a uh, driver. Um, the best, let's say, quarter of each class is said, uh, is invited to become, to learn to instead of become tank commanders. So they do the same basic training as the other enlisted, but they kind of serve their entire IDF careers, what would be called elsewhere NCOs. Um, and then the best among these are offered the opportunity to become officers. But sp And yes, they also go through a gen generalist officer school to, to learn combined arms and such. But they're tankers first and then officers. In the American Army, it's the exact opposite. You, first of all, go to officer school to um, ROTC or service academy, and then, in descending order of class rank, um, at least traditionally, you would, this is how you, uh, you pick uh, where you want to go. And yeah, you could say, okay, I like infantry, or I like tanks. But, and then you study the topic, like you're an officer first, and let's say tanker second. Um, and sometimes they do... Uh, mix and match that someone who uh, has background in, let's say, commanding infantry platoons, upon promotion to captain, might be assigned to command tanks. This does exist. Um, to, to the point that I found an article a couple of weeks ago that literally, by, by someone who literally had that career path, like giving some advice. So, um, so and, and anyway, so the superiority of the generalist to the uh, specialist persists. But the constant moving does not, um, except for the political appointees who do move around um, and essentially mess things up whenever they get up in the morning. Often, even if they don't get up in the morning, like their existence messes things up by making the uh, actual experts more timid. Um, but, the, but the managers stay, and this means that they are kind of a group that by itself kind of siloed away um so maybe they stay nine to five and they think everyone else is like that they think that this is normal when it is not um and th and this is a big problem with um a lot of american transit planning it's the managers don't use their system moreover on top of not using their system they don't even use transportation like ordinary white collar workers so you would expect that in a place like new york the managers would use the system but no they don't um, it was actually considered weird that uh, Andy Byford did not have a car or perhaps even know how to drive and use the subway to get places. And this is New York, a city where um, the average income for, sorry, the median income for a transit commuter is slightly less, I think maybe 1% less than for a solo driver and with higher inequality. So um, it's, so, so, so if anything, um, the, uh, so, so if anything, people in the top, let's say 10, 20 percent, are, are maybe a little bit disproportionately likely to be using public transport. And yes, I, I mean, I mean, it's richer people, so they often have the car; they just don't use it. Um, but first of all, they still don't use it. Second, there's plenty of rich people who don't own a car in New York, and even that one. But that would, but the managers at the MTA stick to this kind of nine to five culture and then drive everywhere else. That the Byford was behaving like. Every tech worker in New York, um, probably every or most professors, certainly, uh, certainly like every professor is still in the city. Um, like I don't know about doctors, but but certainly like some of the doctors in the city, like many of the lawyers in the city, and that was considered weird. And this is a big problem because um, most of white collar America is not Don Draper, and I don't mean that most white collar most of white collar America is more capable of treating women as humans uh, 
than Dom Draper. Um, even though that's also a thing. I mean, most of white collar America works different hours from what was the norm 60 years ago. And yeah, there are celebrities on the subway, of course. Celebrities take the subway. It's New York. Um, like, in L.A., it's different. In L.A., one of the things that I was told from uh, uh, people trying to make it as actors, people who have to do a lot of auditions and such, is that, um, first of all, there's no public transit, so you need a car. You need to drive to auditions. Um, you will always get parking fines because there's no way to gauge in advance how long you're going to be parked there. So one of your costs of doing business you should be thinking of is parking fines. Um, and of course, New York is different. I mean, people walk. Hell, I lived in when I lived in Tel Aviv. I, I lived in like this, this this kind of standard schlock urban middle class neighborhood, and like I would occasionally, not very often, but I would occasionally see a celebrity. Um, again, it, it's a thing, and, and I mean, not gonna be on the not on the bus or anything, but walking. Yeah. Um. So this is really important because it means that. You need to think of commuter rail as, and again, this is what goes into the crayon. This is not something you do different scenarios. It's something you just say, this is how it shall be done. In the same way that when we here in Euroland do all these millions of scenarios for planning, let's say, commuter rail, we're not saying, what about the scenario in which you only run at rush hour? We don't do that. So, again, do a lot of scenarios. Again, I'm doing more crayon than planning. Um, but do a lot of scenarios, but don't do a scenario in which you barely run any off-peak service. That's stupid. And once you understand that, once you understand that this needs to work primarily as urban rail with suburban tails, with healthy suburban rider check, but as urban rail, that's, where, that's your workhorse, okay? Um, the, when, so when, so I'm, so I follow in the stats of this dude. Um, I consider him, I, I consider him the origin story of all Mo of all modern technical advocacy for public transport in the United States. Um, there are a handful of other people um, in the Bay Area who would also count, like Elizabeth Alexis, of course, Dean Levin, and who can forget Richard and Lee uh, the man, uh, the myth, the legend, uh, the one who wrote uh, this uh, lovely prose. The sad thing is he's correct, by the way. Um, so, so I'll let you stew on this for uh, one minute just to understand. This is from 2008, because this is how bad planning was even in the early 2000s in the Bay Area. Uh, I'm not saying this is the bad thing. This is a proposal. Like, this language is uh, the response to some complaints from bad planning from the early 2000s. Anyway, so this dude, um, it... Again, in conjunction with Richard, uh, in conjunction with Richard, he did this kind of service planning metrics about uh, how many people there are near each uh, existing or potential station for Caltrain. One of the things he points out is that um, the downtown extension is so important just because right now Caltrain is kind of weird. It doesn't go into downtown San Francisco. Um, there had been plans by the Southern Pacific to build such a thing, but they never happened. Um, so it, it's just outside city center and like literally he has, uh, something called census driven service planning where he looks at jobs near each station. Um, so this is maybe about jobs, but it's only also, but even he points out that he has to, he has to do certain escape clauses in the planning. Oh, uh, sorry, let, let me catch up on this. Rural Japanese Diamond Report. Yeah. Uh, do you think you have a lack of regular useful citizens? Uh, um, it depends. Um, some things are extremely well. So commuting in America is extremely well, uh, is, is, is extremely well documented. Non-commute trips are the ones that um, are poorly documented to the point that people are starting to rely on surveillance app data. Yeah, exactly. Uh, exactly. Part. So, anyway, so let's so start to talk about the Bay Area for a sec. Clem points out that if he doesn't escape well, certain things like minimum trip distance, or I think he at one point does minimum $40,000 a year job, um, essentially he's assuming no uh, fare integration. He explains, he says, look, if you're trying to do this 
on the existing system and you just assume perfect integration, then essentially Caltrain is just going to, like, by far the most important trip pair on Caltrain is going to be from 22nd Street, uh, which I hope that on Zoom I will actually be able to see it is here, um, to maybe not force anything, because you can kind of see that the skyscrapers are here and the station is here, but certainly to um, Transbay if that ever gets built. That will just overwhelm everything else because this is actually dense urban. San Francisco, reminder, is the second densest major American city. Um, San Francisco County is the fifth densest American county. It goes Manhattan, Brooklyn, the Bronx, Queens, and San Francisco. Um, so yeah, New York is, is denser, but San Francisco is number two. Um, so the thing is, if you actually do good planning, and plan is obviously aware of good planning, okay? We're talking about like a German-French dude. Um, um, a German friend who literally was like a DGV, like rail, like, like has, there's like a lot of rail fan material on like the old, like n late nineties, early 2000s internet about the Tesh it was literally written by him. Um, and, uh, so if you do it right, there's going to be so much urban traffic that you need to take care of. Now we're doing Jersey, which is less urban than the New York side. I mean, Remember, I, I gave you the five densest counties. Hudson is number six. So this is a lot denser than this. Um, and this matters because um, if we if we were to do one of the non nac things, like line theory to do with Hempstead, as I said, um, demand like far sales or Kew Gardens to Penn Station or with this kind of transfer to Grand Central, that would overwhelm all the suburban demand. Like, essentially, like this is basically a line. The way I'm conceiving of this line, it, like most of it goes from Manhattan to Eastern Queens, to, to like Central and Eastern Queens. And yeah, these are okay tales. There are some jobs here, but that's not the interesting part. This is the interesting part. Ditto line five. I mean, the interesting part is within the city. And yeah, sure, you can do tales like um, Far Rockaway, Long Beach. You can have some tail trains that go as far as Babylon or beyond. But really, the interesting parts of this line are Brooklyn and Queens. So here... It's not as extreme because, again, there's less urban stuff on the Jersey side. Jersey is more suburban. The uh, all, all those New York jokes, uh, mocking down, mocking, looking down on New Jersey because it's suburban. There is something to them, despite ongoing redevelopment. Um, and even, of course, that New York is not do the best. We all know what state does the best mockery of Jersey. How would I serve with uh, Hudson with this past Bergen line in Hoboken? Good question. Hudson County, uh, the, the, the urban part of Hudson County has this annoying aspect of not really being between things. So there are two things that you could do. One coming from very early current that I drew is to do another Jersey. And Phil, I, I used to not do Bergen line, but I used to do something here called Connell Avenue. Um, so a, a junction between the northern branch here and the main line, uh, which is something that you can do. Um, I'm not as happy with it as I used to be because um, I do because I'm aware of where the buses go, which is here, and the land use here, which is this. And yes, you can redevelop, but if you're choosing locations to redevelop, choose a better location to redevelop, like this. Um, so, yeah, Hudson County has this problem that it's not really a between county because it's formed around ferry connections to Manhattan or maybe um, around um, a coach to ferry. I don't remember if there were ever streetcars on um, Bergen Line. Um, or so, so either probably to ferry or, or bus to ferry. Um, and so the connections are not amazing. So what you do is... Um, um, I have this constant subway crayon, which is to just run a subway from Fort Lee here um, along Bergen Line to Jersey City. Um, then there's, um, for entering the city, there's a path. There might be subway expansion if you have low enough construction costs and you can just do these kind of meme-y subway expansions, the, the, these, these meme-y subway expansions like the Southern. Um, of course, Bergen Line, the whole point of this Bergen Line Avenue stop is not just, oh, people can walk from here. I mean, yeah, sure, this is a very dense area. But the point of my choice of Bergen Line and not literally anywhere else 
is, is not the, the, the intersection of, of um, Broken Line and 20... I, I think actually the um, line $2 as I'm drawing is going to be a lot further to the south, like here. It's not the intersection of Bergen Line with, um, w w uh, w with something like Twenty First Street is unusually important. It isn't. It's just that all the buses are on Bergen Line, so they will stop here. So yes, a lot of walk up ridership, but also bus to commuter train. So this is um, uh, so a lot. So so, the, so Bergen Hill would be served like this. Um, if there's a way. To plan this with maybe an exit at JFK, so that um, uh, argues in favor of uh, making the like during like bring it as a cavern farther west with one exit, one set of exits at Bergen Line and another leading up to JFK. That might be an option because there are also a lot of buses on here. Um, I can say go either way. Um, then um, and uh, then uh, more connections. Uh, when this get built with things like the Bergen Arches, the Hoboken, um, HBR becomes a lot stronger if these things start getting built because suddenly it's not just connecting to Path but to more interesting things than Path. Um, HBL, uh, beyond this, it, it's going to be HBLR to Jersey City, pretty probably forever unless the HBLR, which uh, I did kind of mean crown, uh, unless parts of it are kind of dismembered to become um, kind of subway extensions or something. Um, so it's a very good question, and thank you for, for uh, so, so thank you for, for asking this, Prague, because obviously when you're talking about how this is to be useful as urban rail, note that I'm not even talking about commuter rail right now, I'm just thinking of how commuter rail fits as urban rail, and yeah, but, um, not Bergen, Houston County is a really important part of it. Um, yeah, I saw that the, the Jersey City mayor wants to go from West End, uh, this is a really good thing because there are plans to uh, do some highway widening here, because uh, some people have not heard of climate change um, or something. And the counter proposal is to instead take this. You see, there used to be a rail line here um, and kind of extend the slight rail line, which I think is a good idea, but m make sure that the bridges can be in the future retrofitted to be heavy rail, in case, um, to go to downtown or This is, I think, really useful. Um, so this is Hudson. Again, Hudson is not great for commuter rail by itself. It's good for other things connecting to commuter rail, um, light rail, buses. Um, um, uh, a lot of redevelopment in Secaucus. So can you see the land use here? I mean, sure, there's a little bit of this, but can you see how amazing this DOD is? Um, but now we need to move on to Newark. So I keep drawing this as South Newark or Newark South Street. Um, this may have been a historic rail station. I'm forgetting. Um, there were more historic rail stations here that have been closed. Just remember, South Street was one of them. But they were not very useful for urbanites because the frequency always sucked. The uh, fares were very high. Uh, happened also on the Queen side for the Long Island Railroad. Essentially, as soon as the subway reached an area, LRR ridership there died in in, in Central Queens. Um, so this is, I think, an obligatory location. I mean, you can study it, but it's going to look very strong. Uh, and this, of course, means also making sure that the buses feed that, because the uh, very strong buses of uh, New Jersey, uh, my understanding is that the strongest New Jersey City buses are all Newark buses, because the um, Hudson to Manhattan buses are so strong that they've all been replaced by um, private minibuses. Um, that kind of elbowed New Jersey Transit out of a profitable market so that New Jersey Transit has to get subsidies. Uh, yeah, I know, I know that follow up wants transit inside. Like, follow up is good and you should join ETA, but, um, uh, but, but anyway, um, the point is that a good thing to do is to figure out how the buses can then connect to South Newark. Now, the problem is, is that. It's mostly going to be from the west, not from the east, because there's less Newark from the east than from the west. The west is kind of designed, you can see Springfield Avenue to downtown Newark. The, um, now, this is an okay alternative route, but it doesn't quite feed South Street, which is annoying. Um, and there's this um, square that can be used for activation in Lincoln Park, but not close enough. And so something like this, I don't know. Um, 
So, again, look at how the bus network can make use of this new station, but there's also going to be a fair amount of walk-up ridership. I mean, not everything has to be just about buses. There's walk-up ridership. This is, like, Newark, Newark is... I mean, I'm not saying Newark is the density of Brooklyn or anything, but you can look at the land use here. This is not... I mean, I would be unhappy if this is what DOD looked like, but if this were pre-existing, then sure, I mean... Uh, so, this is already here. South North, thankfully, because I did at least do some of the crayon previously. Newark Airport is kind of weird, because this is not the airport. The airport is here. There's an air train. The air train kind of sucks. Um... In a mega crayon future, I can see like a direct line here, but honestly, the it's the the the, wor the worst thing about the air train is how the fare gates are structured. That they create a di an additional point of queuing, and the problem with these additional points of queuing is that so many of the people queuing are tourists and don't have monthlies, and also um, just as a way of stiffing people who try to ride to the airport. Um, the monthlies are often not, like, for example, in, uh, even on the JFK side, um, JFK Air Train does not accept, I mean, it accepts MetroCard on a paper ride basis, but it does not accept monthlies. So, um, so because of that, this creates long queues, which are very stressful for all involved. Um, so again, organization before concrete, stop having, stop trying to make Port Authority profiteer at other people's expense if they want to uh, pay this off, raise landing charges. Um, at any rate, you should be taxing people who don't use transit and not just people who do use transit um, for airport improvement, maybe. Okay, now. Uh, so let's say the stop stays and is not replaced by some th sort of thing where um, there's, I don't know, some kind of path extension that goes like this or some air train extension that goes back to North Um North Elizabeth technically still exists as a station that barely has any service. This should be a full-time stop. It's like again, this is urban. All of this is urban. Um, now this now at this point you're getting to things that identify less urban. Um, I don't remember what the um, car ownership rate is, but um, but I believe so because it's not so every in every American municipality other than New York City, a majority of people own cars. And Newark and your majority don't. But let me see. Vehicles available. Note that this is not, it will not tell me, uh, okay, I guess it's physical housing characteristics. And all I care about really is vehicles available. I don't care about other things. That is a problem. A lot of questions are kind of hard to answer. Let's move myself to the other end so you can see this with me. Extend pass to Newark. I mean, first of all, I don't think that, I mean, that has other problems is the thing. And um, again, I can see this happening, but if there's room for two more tracks on this, like on this segment, I don't think that path is the best. Like, I mean, I mean like, you, like you see what I'm doing? There, there is a thing where Oh, vehicles available. No vehicle available. It is 10 households out of uh, 122 million. Um, and hefty share of these 10 million households live in the five boroughs. So let's try to do geos and see if I can do... Elizabeth City, New Jersey. Mm-hmm. 41, 42,000 occupied housing units. Vehicles available, no vehicle available, 9,000. So 20 something percent. But note that it's uh, often one vehicle available. The median is one vehicle available, not multiple vehicles available. And not because these are um, all one person households. By the contrary, this is 42,000 people. Elizabeth has. Way more than that, Elizabeth, New Jersey. Weren't it a little more than 100? Oh, more than 100, 137. So the average occupied housing unit has uh, 
three point something people, but the median only has one car. So, um, bear in mind that in Berlin, I believe in Berlin, a majority of household owns cars, but a very small majority of household of households owns cars. So, this is still pretty urban. So, you want stops there: North Elizabeth, Elizabeth. There's also, I think, a historic South Elizabeth stop that um, that um, has been completely closed, just as North Elizabeth is effectively just closed. Um, so this is already included. Oh, it's not included. Okay, so we need to fix that. Mr. Rose, South Elizabeth, 160. Um, now we need to find the kilometer point for this, and we're going to do this by Linden and not by Elizabeth because Linden is straight. Baltimore Junction is about the is kind of a mean. So this is 3.5. Um, it's kind of a meme. It's only if you extend the Staten Island Railroad all the way here. I mean, let's drop it. So we said 3.5 from Linden. So that's one and a half kilometers. Yeah, that sounds about correct. Then we start opening up Linden and Railway. Don't think you need more info. And then what? Um, and then we do the usual, so Metro Park, Metachan, Addison, New Brunswick, Jersey Avenue is kind of a local stop. I mean, you can do Monmouth Junction. I, I think it's a popular stop, but look at the land use. I mean, sure, if you really want, but I mean, like this complex, I mean, how much ridership is this going to generate? And more importantly, how much ridership is it going to generate that's not going to require me to buy a new train set just for these people? It's only going to run like an hour a day in the peak direction, each direction. Or it could run more, but it's going to be empty. Um, so let's not. So, so I mean, this does do monolith junction. We can keep it. It's okay, but I mean. Um, so this is assuming all trains make all stops of working, which I think is actually not a bad Starting assumption, but we do need to include a little bit of that. So now we need to do the time. Uh, time, uh, we're going to kill all of these. So this should be ignored. Time is, at any all point, how long it takes to get from this key point to the, to the next kilometer point to the next kilometer point. And we're also going to absorb into the time the uh, stop penalty, if it is a stop. Um, Penn Station is 500 meters at 50 kilometers an hour, um, which is going to be 36 seconds, which is what I did, I grew before I deleted. Um, now, this is 3.2, right? 3.7 minus 0.5, divided by 100 kilometers an hour. Uh, but this is false. The reason this is false is we also need to take care of the acceleration, this um, the slow zone from 50 to 100. Uh, so let's uh, finally boot my code, which has been lying here for so long. Initial acceleration, I'm going to do 1.2. Uh, power to weight ratio, I'm going to do 18. Um, and notice I'm citing a lot of assumptions about the rolling stock. It's just completely um, standard here for regional. And oh, I, you know, already, so we need to do slow pen, K, A, B, C, N. This is from 50 to 100, and this is only in one direction. So this is seven seconds. Um, and again, we're dividing that in two because it's only because the slope run is acceleration plus acceleration. Here we need the average of these two. So 3.6 plus, we said, 115 point something, right? So this is 118, and 19. But, um, and, and again, the stop penalties, and, and we're not recording stop penalties in time, only between speeds, only between running speed zones. So Bergen Line Avenue is 1.1 kilometer at 100. 
So 39.6, which we call 40. Uh, this is 1.1 kilometers at 150. Note that suddenly the 150 here is dead letter. Um, and the reason this is dead letter is that um, 1.1 kilometers from a stop, you don't hit 150, you hit about 130 or something. So we're actually going to eliminate this row. Um, and and uh, we're going to say that this is 160. Um, so actually the row to be eliminated is this one. And the thing is uh, speed limit. 150, but trains do not accelerate fast enough to hit up to 55.9. Okay. And now we move these up. Um, so from 4.8 to 8, we say it's 160. Um, so 72 seconds, but again, there's a stop, there's, there's a speed zone change. We do need to take that into account. So, uh, slope and this is 12-ish seconds. But again, it's all divided by time, so this is going to be 78. And as usual, stop penalty is absorbed elsewhere. This is 6 kilometers at 160, pretty straightforward. This is 2 kilometers at 110, which is not a very nice number. So it's 66. 1.6 kilometers at 160. Uh, this is what is um what is twenty point three minus seventeen point six? I should maybe move my head to this side so you can see the names of the stations. It's more important right now. Um, two point seven. All of this is at one sixty. Fifty one. Um, which is a little bit weird because you know something. Let's not do it one sixty. Let's. So think it takes two kilometers to even accelerate to 160. So let's say so let's let me actually say speed west, but um trains so so here's the thing, okay. If I draw if I if I drew this and I do act dist, so this is acceleration distance. It's two kilometers. Um and yeah, it's maybe faster to decelerate, but not enough. And you need to accelerate and decelerate. So if I do act this and I only let trains run as far as 120, then that's probably more realistic of what can be done in a place like South Newark. Um, and the point is that this is already a three, uh, an existing four-track line by South Newark. So, um, the, so certainly, I mean, yeah, there might, there might be some track during if we do express trains, but interstate trains are never going to be on this. So. Let me just say trains run at 120 due to tight stop spacing. This is going to be important. Um, so this is not actually 30 seconds because this is one thing, but we're going to respond. We're going to be 48, but we're going to get more all of that through less of a stop penalty. South North is 2.7, that's not North North Airport is 2.7, where you still can't quite do one, uh, um, 160. So let's say trains run at 140 due to tight stop spacing. Um, if we do something like actist, then ductus. I mean, there's a little bit of cruising at 140, but not a lot. So this is not quite pointless, but close to it. I can even do like um, 
135 just because this is a slightly rounder number or something, but it's not very important. Newark Airport, and I still, and, and this is, this is 2.9, I still think you need to run a little slower. So 2.9, um, honestly, if you want, I can relabel this is 20.4 just to make this a little, again, to make the numbers a little rounder, but I don't think it's terribly important. 75, and if this were rounder, it would be 72 at 72. Um, now, North Elizabeth, this is 1.6, so it need to be this. Um, this is 1.5, and again, it's completely irrelevant. There's a kilometer of 150. This is going to be, yes, I know what I'm doing. And only at South Elizabeth do we start running fast, because this is 3.5, and marginally you can run, start running at 160. Um, and this tells us certain things, like that. Um, if the point is to just get trains for Newark and Elizabeth, it doesn't matter how fast they run. I mean, you can get trains with a no smaller motor or something just through for a for a top suit of 130 or something if it's easier. Which is why the Japanese commuter trains aren't very fast. I mean, they're entirely urban. And yes, I, I saw this problem. Um, and so 120. This is 1.6. Weigh 120. It's 48. This is 1.5, 45, and now are we starting to talk? This is 79. Linden to railway is uh, 3.5 as well, so same number. Railway to Metro Park is 6.3. And you see, now that we're in the suburbs, in the proper suburbs, that's when we start um, being able to leverage how fast the trains are. Um, and this is why European regional trains are this fast, because they're designed for not very dense areas. And note that I'm always rounding up, not down. New Brunswick is 2.8 Jersey Avenue, so trains run down. This is going to be 72. I already know this. Here's the Avenue to Monmouth Junction. This is 12.2, so very long interstation. I want to use the maximum amount. Uh, this is 11 kilometers, so definitely same thing. Princeton Junction to Hamilton, that's 9. And finally, Hamilton to Renton. Hamilton. I do, was Hamilton named after um, every uh, liberal American's favorite um, right wing, like, like, like favorite um, favorite conservative? Or... Is it just me being? Really, there are three different Hamiltons. Oh, okay, so it is not known whether it was named after every liberal American's favorite conservative founder, but most likely, yes. Um, dude was a literal fucking Tory, and Americans on the left love him because there's a musical made by someone who thought that he was anti-slavery when he wasn't. Okay, so now let's do the stop penalties. Um, so this is just slow pen, and remember that on the end we... Do half. This is 12, so this is white 6. Bergen line, it's so, and by the way, when you earn the boundary between two speed zones, you average them. So Bergen line is 100, 100, because it's a 100 tunnel. So it's going to be slope 10, K, A, B, C, and 0, 100. This is 25. C caucus is 160, 160. Um, 
No, it's, it's pre-populated, but I believe it might be... Oh, yeah, so this is... Oh, so this is not 25, I'm pardon me. This is 55. Because you always add 30 for the... Uh, you, you have to always add 30 for um, dwell time. Um, now, you could get away with a little less than 30. Uh, um, sometimes you can do uh, 25. I, I've seen 20 to 25 in Munich. Uh, but 30 is more standard, so it's 35. And this is, it's not going to be 76 because the slow pen is 48. So we're not going to assume 27 or 28 just to be contrary. We're going to do 78. Manhattan transfer, this is where I'm going to do things with um, different zones. So 160, 110. So this is the 160 zone. Um, and let's actually automate this. So for uh, I in range 100, so we start from 100, we end at 170, and we do a step of 10. Um, print 0, 2, You, this is how you print, right? Yes. You print zero two. And, and, and let me see if I can remember the syntax. I And then the actual thing that we need. Now watch me not remember how to do print commands. Oh, I mean, I just, I mean, there's too much white space, but yeah, I actually got it right. I am surprised that I managed to not make a gross error in syntax, but sure. Okay. Um. So Newark. Is going to be so my hand transfer is going to be average of 160 and 110. So what is so this is 160 and this is 110. So it's average of 48 plus 28. So it's 38. And we always add 30. I think I here I forgot to add 30. So when I did 160 and like previous time. So this is going to be 110 and 120. Uh, so the average of this, which is about 28, and this is which is about so so these average these are going to average to um it's not going to be 30, right? It's going to be 29 and a half. So I need to um, round it to 30, so 60. Now this averages so so it's, so the speed zones here go 120, 140, 140, 120, 120. So this is between 120 and 140, um, which you can absolutely do in the middle. The, this, these functions are not perfectly linear, but good enough. Um, so these will actually average. It's a little more than 31 and a little less than 30. It's going to average 35 and a bit. Um, so in so we are compelled to make it 36. So it's going to be 66. This is going to be. Uh, 140, so 39. Um, North Elizabeth, uh, it's This is going to be uh, 120 to the south, 120 to the north. So this should be the straight off this, which is 32. Uh, this is going to be 120 and 160, which we've already done. I'm confused. Oh, right, because it's not 120 and 160, it's 120 and 110. 120 is 30. <coughs> it's like 32 and 48, so the average is going to be 40. Um, And then it's just going to be the full 160. 
until the end almost. And there is until and almost is here we have 160 and 140 to handle, which is 48.39. So uh, average always round up 44. And here we go back to just 160, which is 48 divided by 224, and we don't need to do dwells because it's the end station. Now, total time is going to be. I mean, these are a little bit wonky because, but at the end of the day, we are summing all of these. So the total time is 3680. Um, again, the sum is wonky, and we need to rearrange that. But uh, so the total time should be. Um, like if something in the middle, it's everything up until here. So it's going to be up until 9, not 10. So this is going to be this. Um, and now this is just multiplied by the pad factor, which is 1.07 always. And this is... Uh, total trip time, which is rounded to a half minute. Um, but um, the way the int is designed here is that it's not rounded down. It's not rounded up to a half minute. It's rounded to closest. So you can see this is 270 seconds in a bit, which if you round up is five, but it's actually four and a half. So yeah, that's a timetable. Um, now, I'm not saying anything about Frequency. Now, bear in mind, this is an all local train that might not exist. It might be that all the all locals only go as far as Jersey Avenue. Um, and then the expresses, and then we need to figure out where the expresses stop. Um, and then we need to figure out how they overtake. Um, or maybe they don't overtake. It's a local, local track, express tracks. And then it's a question of, oh, how do the high speed trains overtake the expresses? Um, if this is, so if this is expressed, the, the thing is, um, it's not great for drawing it here because, um, so bear in mind that most of this area is six track. So Elizabeth is four track narrows, but Newark Airport is six track. Linden and Norway is, are six track. A lot of it is just something that's from Metro Park to the south that's four, that's pure four track. And there, we don't have the coastline anymore, which helps. So, the, so if you want to ask questions about how, um, overtakes work, then let's see, from, if you have these all local trains from, Railway to Trenton, it's 33 minutes, with the pad, of course. Now, how fast is this by high-speed train? This is about 60 kilometers. Um, you don't need to believe my speed zones, but let's go with my speed zones just because I wrote them. Uh, again, you can quibble. Usually the equivalents make it easier because it means less. Oh, so this is going to, all going to be in Newark to Philadelphia, and we have these speed zones. Um, so um, Newark is KP sixteen. Same thing here. Um, now the question is which one is Metro Park and which one is uh, Railway's Metro Turn. Railway is about seventeen. Um, a little bit later, do we need to start worrying? Um, so about 17 or 18, and then Trenton, 96, 93 and a half minus 16 is a little less than 80, right? It's 77 and a half. Uh, now, this is partly 250, partly 360 territory. Uh, and yes, this does assume the trains are going to blast on the L through uh, New Brunswick at 360. And yeah, um, so even if we do these assumptions, which I'm going to be upfront, are aggressive. Yeah, we can figure out how much this is, and we can do we can do it. To, so we can use this as a speed zone calculator as well, because um, we have there's three points, right? Um, because we have two segments that are shared. Um, I mean, 
gonna I'm gonna see if I can find the exact point at which it goes from six tracks to four. But uh So notice how this is so notice that this is uh, oh is this already four this four track because this clearly has the remnant of a sixth of a fifth and sixth track through a railway and Oh no it's not a remnant, there are actual tracks, they're just Oh I guess they just don't have the remnants are of a seventh and eighth or something. Just these are Oh, it may be a matter of like wooden versus uh concrete sleepers. And I believe that they uh that this stays four track until uh six track until the junction with uh um until until this junction, but maybe it's not as easy to put the uh uh to, to put the locals. But if we but if we do it this way, um then uh then what? Um then the junctions from the locals are gonna be what? Um, so we start from so again we start from about railway as as the start point. So seventeen point three. Um, and I believe that this does let you start from not zero. This calculator. So actually, we can do thirty three point three. And then where is the speed zone change? Sixteen. So it's 27.7, which is 43.7. And then finally, Trenton, which is 93.5. So the way it works is that U is the kilometer point vector, and V is the speed zone list. So start from 250 and at 360. And now we need to do speed. Uh, speed zone K. So we're going to define W to be speed zone K of K and V C N U V N. All of these variables are already bound. So if you're wondering what these are, um, this is so the numbers that look round, um, are the um, so, so the numbers that look round are going to be the, oh, I see where the problem is. Okay, okay, okay. So the numbers that look round are going to be the numbers that are um, just the uh, trip times, and then the numbers that don't look round are the slow zones, uh, are, are the, not slow zones, are the slow, uh, are the acceleration and deceleration penalties, but this assumes that there's a station at the start and the end of this. So this is so this is where the fifty four bit is from. Um, also, bear in mind that I'm assuming uh, that these are all uh, commit rails. So just say the K, okay? So um, we're gonna do slope ten K A B C M zero two fifty by three point six N, and this is exactly twice this because of how that doesn't work. So what we actually need is to extract one four seven point one four nine point seven six. 498, and then this number, which is not going to be this because we're doing slope on trains that are way more powerful. I mean, maybe not the same K, maybe not the, not with as strong an A and M, but it doesn't matter from 250 to 360. So instead of K, we're going to put in 23.7. So you're going to put A to think instead of a duplex. Um, I think you can do a little bit, you can do something comparable with new German trains. Japanese trains are going to be 26.74. So if we do this, and then A, B, C, we're not going to do C because uh, there's going to be a lot less air resistance. Actually, this, the stuff that's compatible with everything else is about 12, not 44. And this does matter at this scale. And let's do 0 0.7, not that it matters. This is... So the slow penalty, notice that this is a sense of way worse slow penalty. This is 95, and this is suddenly, I mean, 90, uh, and this is 35. And know that if we try to do slow pan on our normal train, it's going to be a lot worse, because our normal train is not designed for this. 
like literally this is how much in theory it would be uh, if it were possible for regional trains to get to 100 to 360 kilometers an hour this is how long it would take them to accelerate but and this is the slow penalty not the acceleration time which is a lot worse um so what we actually do is we take one point uh, this plus this plus the slope and divided by two, which I'm going to 1.2468, let's just call it 35.25 for sanity's sake, divided by two, 665, yeah. So let's add it to 666 for lol's sake, 713. So this is 713 seconds, um, which is a little less than 12 minutes. And note that this is 30, the difference of 33 minutes. So that's what we need to squeeze. Yeah. Um, so we need to squeeze. So so if these trains share tracks, um, then it's 33 minutes again versus. Uh, about 12. And can we do that? Well, not really, because this caps our frequency if we don't have overtakes, right? Because it um, usually the overtake is, uh, the, 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 the minimum frequency is the difference in the trip times plus separation. Separation is going to be, I think, two minutes um, fast ahead of slow, three minutes slow ahead of fast. So add about five minutes for if you're adventures, which you might need to be, but it's not going to help you when it's a 20 minute difference. These are not trains that are supposed to run every half hour. These are trains that are supposed to run every 10 minutes. So, um, does this mean we can't do it? No, it doesn't. Because remember, this is not a two track line, this is a four track line. So these never show track. Now, this does mean that might, you might need to lose local express separation because, um, so let's say these are locals, the locals down the local track. Now let's try to do the express station on this, okay? So what would the express stations do, uh, the express trains do? Um, I imagine the trains, the express trains are going to not stop at Rowway or London or South Elizabeth, but we're only starting to see that as a difference um, um, once there might be track sharing, right? Um, so, skip, so start from Rowway, pretend that it's stopped just, for, just to avoid needing to recalculate this. Um, then there's Metro Park, which probably should be still made. But Dutch and Edison, you can skip. But, um, okay, wait. If we're running local trains all the way to Trenton, why are we all running express trains all the way to Trenton, right? Maybe we're running local trains only to Jersey Avenue, where they can turn, and running express trains, and then the express trains use the express tracks up to Jersey Avenue, and then they shift to the local track, and I don't know if there are turnouts there, but if there aren't, they can be built very easily. Um, and so maybe the only segment we need to worry about is Rowway through Jersey Avenue. And Rowway through Jersey Avenue, we see this is 18 minutes, and it's not actually 18 minutes because the local trains don't share tracks with the, uh, with the intercities because the intercities have dedicated tracks. This is a four-track Line. I mean, the question is, who can the express trains share? Can, can the express regionals share track with? And this is this can be answered. I mean, they can, for example, stay on the local. I mean, stay, they can stay on the local tracks here because they're st they're skipping railway. Okay, and then they shift maybe past railway, and then they um and th and then they and, and then it's also it's only a problem for a local and. Uh, an express commuters past Metro Park, and it's literally a difference of two stops. Now we know what difference the two stops makes because it's literally recorded here, and there are no differences in, uh, and, and there are no differences here in uh, what's it called in the uh, in the speed zones. It's two and a half minutes, two minutes thirty six. But wait, there's a pad. Ideally, you also want to make this work if the faster train uh, has to run without pad to recover from delay and the slow train is fully padded, but it's 
honestly okay, even if they're both bad. I mean, you can't, you should not do it if they're, if neither is bad. That would, that's fragile. So this is about a three minute difference, a little less than a three minute difference. Okay, so one train runs every ten minutes, the other train runs every ten minutes. There's a three minute difference. Who cares? I mean, it, it, it's not going to be. I mean, they're just going to. There are going to be timetables. It's going to be a little bit constrained, but it's not going to be such a big deal. Um, so that's something that's pretty easy. Um, now it does get a little hairy because we have four track hours here as well, and we do need to plan it. But um, and and but let's do it in easy mode a little bit for a sec, and then. If we do it in easy mode, let's say all of this is X track, um, even Elizabeth, almost, and I think Elizabeth might even have space for a fifth track. And if you're demolishing things to straighten the S curve, just put in a six, just put in a fifth of the sixth track. Um, and so the, uh, and so it's a situation where once you break this down, the track sharing is not actually that problematic. Um, and again, these are trades should be very frequent. Like I, I'm genuinely gonna back. A train every like a rush hour, maybe a, a, maybe something like a local every ten minutes, an express every ten minutes, and a Jersey coastline train every ten minutes, and then you try to run them in a way that makes the local and the express um, be like not local and express, sorry, the local and the Jersey coastline local um, be um, at a five minute gap um, on the shirt. Track on the short segment up to railway, so Elizabeth gets five minutes surface to Manhattan. I mean, better when you call the crosses. Um, and bear in mind that this is something that doesn't require, assume anything except some kind of gateway. Um, and yeah, and when you, and when you do that, for uh, and you do that, I mean, you don't, you're not going to time buses because with, again, who the hell times buses for a train that run for trains that run every 10 minutes, let alone every five minutes into my hand. Um, essentially, just means you get it's extremely frequent. I mean, off-peak, you might be able to just do it every 10 minutes, and even then, you wouldn't be timing the buses um, from, from Elizabeth from Elizabeth to Manhattan. You, you always want the frequency to be a, the headway to be a small fraction of the overall trip time. So if Elizabeth is, so if, let's say, North Elizabeth is 21, 10 minutes is going to be okay. Five minutes, people aren't going to even care if, if they miss a train. Uh, South Newark is probably the controlling point, but South Newark... I mean, it, it's not going to get express stops. The expresses are probably going to do 10. Not sure. I mean, probably Perkin Line just because it's crowded. Secaucus. Not sure about Manhattan, Ranford, Newark, Penn. Elizabeth, Metro Park, probably. And, and New Brunswick, as I'm guessing the... Stops me saying, um, and um, and then the low, and then yeah, South Newark might be a little annoying if it's a train every ten minutes. Um, people would be annoyed if they missed the train. Um, but um, first of all, South Newark also got uh, South Newark also got the trains uh, Raritan Valley Line. Um, like you don't think they should run every ten minutes? I think, but I mean. And um, then you can, but, but by Elizabeth, it should be definitely okay. So again, always think, so again, we're essentially crowning a timetable here. Um, I'm going to actually assume uh, local print and probably better. And I'm going to um, not, actually, you know, something just to be sure, I'm going to delete the sheets that are not in the no assumptions, just that I don't accidentally get confused. Remember, this is a, uh, all, like, all of this is a, uh, yeah, it is a copy-paste of an existing line, so of an existing file, so I'm not going to actually mix the data. Um, so this is an example. Um, and, and, and note that, like, I'm not spelling out all of the different assumptions, but I'm mentioning them verbally, so locals and expresses, what they can share tracks with. Um, now, bear in mind that this is only on the Jersey side, and this is, and and, and I am, and this is a little bit of a cheat code because um, probably it's the same trains, it's these same trains that are going to emerge on the other side as New Haven line trains, unless you do the thing where you specifically try to uh, 
avoid that by having more Synastax do that. Um, just to break something with the... Um, just to break something with what we called with the... Um, with the intercity track sharing. Which again, valid. And... Um, and so it's important to make sure that on the other side these match, but the point is that, at least the way I've drawn these, the local Linux process, yeah, they need to be timetable around each other, but, the local, um, but there's the, the way this is drawn, there's no track sharing between intercities um, and regionals. Um, there's a tra um, track sharing between local and express regionals, but not between intercities and regionals. So this is, this is again, this makes aggressive assumptions. Um, and so this may be like the next space when everything is extract. Not everything, but I mean, um, the narrows to Elizabeth. But, um, the, um, but, and, and you can do a different assumption where it's not, and then you need to be a little more careful about what's going on through, um, through Elizabeth. Um, but again, the different assumptions, how the timetables match. Um, here, again, we're playing a different class from Boston. Even, again, I never remember which one I said, Rogue or, or Wizard, so it's not going to be a matter of... Uh, so, it's, so it's not going to be a matter of, uh, uh, of, I don't know, casting a spell, but rather hiding in the shadows, so we don't need to uh, deal with timed bus transfers. In particular, we don't care where the trains meet. Meets, for people who don't know, meets means that when you have two trains, meets is when trains in opposite direction. Meet. Uh, often, this is how you need to plan a single track. Overtake is slow and fast train when the fast train overtakes the slow. Um, so, for example, we can plan the two directions kind of separately. There's a symmetry axis, of course, and you can find it. Like, it's not important where it is. Um, it's also the point is that I'm also talking about so much peak frequency that um, you're not going to care very much about how to optimize the turnaround times because. Um, it's gonna uh, because look if if all of these trains run local, they probably should it probably should be local to Jersey Avenue and Express fast test. But let's pretend all the trains can't run local and there are twelve trains and let's say ten trains sorry let's say a train every ten minutes runs to Jersey Avenue local and another train per ten minutes at, at, at rush hour runs to Trenton local. Um, how many train sets do we need? Honestly, Jersey Avenue, so if the assumption is that turnaround time is 10 minutes, uh, so bear in mind that the trains will not turn at 10 because this is the running. So the um, trains only have one turnaround here, not two. Um, so to Jersey Avenue, it's like the numbers are decimal for us, right? Because if we do this, then you always have to round up. Um, train every, uh, so, so this is the one way time. Uh, if you're wondering why I added five and not 10, because this is multiplied by two, so it's really 50.5 times two plus 10. Then one turn around on two. So one eleven. um, trains run every 10 minutes. So 12 train sets. You can do it in 11, to be honest, it means to turn around in nine minutes and not 10. And I've seen regional trains in Germany do it in eight all the time. Um, and it's going to also prove important at Trent. Uh, I should not point with my finger, I can't say it. At uh, Trenton, but let's say, so it's 12 train sets with kind of decimal assumptions on this. And then to Trenton, it's going to be 6 times 2 plus 10, so 15 train sets. So this is 27 train sets. Um, yeah, maybe little errors can be one train more or less based on where the, or even two trains is only a bit with the short terms, based on how I'm optimizing this. But do I, how, how much do I care about one extra train set out of 27? I care, it's not nothing, but it's not going to be the guiding principle. So this is, again, something that I don't need to worry about as much because this is a very frequent, or because I'm kind of setting this up as a very frequent Urban line and a pretty frequent peak suburban line, and even off peak. Yeah, off peak maybe if it's trains every 20 minutes, then I care about shaving this half minute. And by shaving this half minute, I mean just getting trains to turn in nine minutes, which they perfectly can. Um, then maybe um, then maybe I start caring, or maybe um, linking this with um, a train on the other side that has some spare minutes to give. Um, 
but again, not the guiding uh, priority for fleet size, certainly not rush hour. Um, and, um, and, again, and again, they're not going to be timed bus connections, but you probably do want the buses to connect to these stations. It's not going to be timed because they're going to be very frequent. Um, but absolutely, you want buses to part of it from um, nodes like the various Elizabeth stops, that, the, the infill stops, like North, which again technically exists, but Bear Lane and Train stop there, South, which has been closed, Linden Oreo, which exists. Um, I can honestly see a case um, for reopen. I mean, maybe not for opening Polonia because look at the land use. And as usual, you can redevelop it. Is this the best place to redevelop, given the distance? But Iselin, I can actually see this being reopened. When they, they opened Metro Park, they closed Iceland and Colonia and built a station designed purely for highway access. This is why Metro Park is where it is. It's near the highway. Um, and there has been some edge state development around it, but not anything that can actually be used as, as for reverse commuting, not without a lot of redevelopment. This is a parking garage. This is not an office tower. Um, so, um, this is, so, so this is kind of planning that you would do in a very frequent urban rail environment and, and a very frequent urban and suburban rail environment. Um, so again, playing New York, New York is, I don't think it's, maybe it's a little bit harder than Boston just because of sheer size, but it's not the roar, as I said at the beginning, the roar is like playing hard mode. This is not playing hard mode, this is playing a different character class when this is pretty well balanced. Um, this is, all of my crown streams take forever. This has been almost four hours, so I'm going to stop here and take questions uh, from those of you who are still here. Uh, this says all seven of you, the numbers are not always correct, but I, if this says seven, it might be nine, it's not going to be 30. Um, so so Prague and, and anyone else, if you have questions about this, then yeah, I'll be happy to, to answer. Oh, I'm sorry. I mean, yeah, I, I mean, yeah, I managed to not do this while starting stream at seven by eating a bit lunch. Do I have any doubt on how the electrification system influences costs? No, I don't. And the reason is that um, the, so, okay, the wires should cost the same. Um, insulation should be more expensive when you have higher voltage, but in places where this is a big problem, like Britain, they've learned how to invent surge arresters. With surge arresters, 25 kV AC has the same required static clearances as DC. So, um, now the issue with now the substations, I believe you need. I believe you need substation more substations for DC. And I'm forgetting whether you need more for. I think you might you might need more for high voltage AC than low voltage AC. But the high, but at high voltage AC, I mean, the edge of SC dust, um, which is a rather hilly line, so trains sometimes do accelerate full speed there, um, and has massive traffic. Like I think 200, like I think something like 300 trains a day in both directions. Uh, there's a 70 kilometer gap between substations. Um, yeah, this is, yeah, you're roughly in that, but you can get away sometimes with a little bit more. And so, and so the costs are, um, usually split over 50-50 between substations and, uh, uh, but it also includes transformers. So I guess sub substations and, uh, and the physical wire. Um, what should it cost? What should... Yeah, so I don't know DC very well, and the reason is that I'm, I believe Italy does DC. 
Um, and Italy does so at low cost, but Italy does a lot of things at low costs. And therefore, I cannot tell you this. And the reason is that the main difference between AC and DC is what country you're in. And that is going to generally overwhelm. And the institutional differences are going to overwhelm. Um, so for, you know, normal schlock, let's call it either Italian, 3KV, DC, or somewhat more slightly more expensive rest of Europe, except the kind of brain farty parts of Britain, um, high voltage AC. If it's a highly, I, I mean, okay, so the question is how much uses the line has. If it's a very busy line, it's already been electrified is the big question. But normally we're talking cheaper, if it's a double track line, um, two and a half million a kilometer, dollars, not euros. I can see three with inflation, but three is like literally going to be in like twenty twenty three dollars or twenty twenty two twenty twenty three dollars, and like all of the numbers that I have are twenty tens dollars, and there three exists. I think in Denmark because they canceled and restarted the project multiple times, and basically everywhere else. Um, yeah, exactly. The um, so the. Um, yeah, the, the project will come with other things. I try to just isolate the... You can sometimes isolate... I try to isolate the catenary cost because there's this tendency that I learned from the Bostonians to look at the bundle of everything and assume it's just electrification and then look at bundles of everything and assume it's just for uh, high platforms and then once they're... <laughs> Uh, and once they made these math errors and uh, assumed everything would cost you know, three times as much as it should, they will find ways to spend the money. I have no idea. I have no idea what the Eastern European costs. Um, I know that the Indian costs are very low. Um, I think something like 500 or 700k PPP dollars, not exchange of dollars per kilometer. Um, but India has, like India is doing this as an internal project. So it's what happens when a low wage country um, does things by itself rather than outsourcing the state to um, the Asian Development Bank. Uh, okay, in Germany and in France and in Denmark and in Norway and in Italy and in Britain, I found numbers that tell you what the just electrification part is. <coughs> like, oh, the uh, they're saying it's going to cost X to electrify. Oh, in Israel. And they're saying it's going to cost X to electrify, Y to install... Uh, ETCS level two and uh, Z to buy new rolling stock or something. Um, the stuff that's usually harder to explicitly take out is if they need to do a lot of bridge modifications for clearances, um, which they do in Britain and generally don't elsewhere. In the US, 2.5. Like again, I can see three, but that's because of inflation. Like in the dollars of the mid to late 2010s, 2.5, and that's on busy, entirely two track lines. Um, if you have a lot of single tracking, you get away with that. Yeah, this is insane. So the, most of it is not going to be the electrification, okay? Um, I can tell you what the Swedish numbers are. I mean, in Sweden, um, I, I have these numbers. I have this blog post called Construction Costs in the Nordic Countries, which unfortunately is before a bunch of some truly ghastly cost over on the Tindelbanen, but I believe the other projects were done and are... Uh, and during budget, uh, two and a half million for two tracks. Um, the Brits like reporting numbers per single track kilometer, and they say something like a billion, like a, billion, a million pounds, or a little, like seven hundred and fifty thousand pounds. So a million dollars in a bit. So for two tracks, it's two point five ish. Assuming they don't need to do anything strange like modify bridges. Um, unfortunately, the Brits also have, unfortunately, this is hard costs, and the Brits have a pension for having extremely high soft costs. It's also an American pension, it's an Anglo pension. Uh, over here, soft costs add, I think, 
design costs at single digit percent, soft costs in general are like, I don't remember, 20, 30 percent, not 100%. Um, yeah, 20 million per kilometer sounds outlandish, even with the track renewal. Track renewal, I mean, the Americans don't spend that on track renewal. Actually, maybe they do. Um, not for not for track kilometer. Though. Um, no, seriously, the Americans can find ways to spend a lot of money, but yeah. Um, so it depends. Um, if you everything. So in the U.S., a lot of lines have done a lot of things, except electrification, which they are allergic to. So in Boston, they are actually doing new signaling. Um, already without electrification. So essentially it's electrification plus high platforms and high platforms can be costed very accurately because Boston already is doing that very slowly. So um, that's something that is actually of interest to a rather large city. Um, I think Toronto might be the same thing. Um, the, they did a lot of things except electrification. Oh, 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 okay, okay. If it's just people trying to uh, extract surplus and share. Um, like always ask for more because, uh, because I wouldn't say no justice, no peace, but, um, like Poland is more no justice and currently there is peace. Oh, okay. Okay. So the, um, municipalities are just trying to, uh, are just working on the principle that if, um, peace is hideously corrupt and they can be two or something. Oh, okay. Oh, it's PKP. Okay. Yeah, sure. Oh, yeah, definitely, definitely. <sighs> yes. Yeah, PKP is a very strange railroad. The, um, there, there's this kind of very French way of timetabling, but also not at French speeds. So. Okay, like every town gets a handful of direct trains to the capital or something, like Spain, I think. But anyway, um, are there more questions? So, so let me ask if there are more questions about this or other things. Oh yeah, okay. You can also do. You can also lose money on design build, but I guess the angles already design build it. Yeah, I have no idea what's going on with PKP. Um, Especially, like, I don't know how good Poland is as a geography for high-speed rail. But, I mean, it's, like, I mean, it's certainly now that uh, all the cities are getting, like, plus however many to population because uh, Putin is not suicidal enough to bomb a NATO country yet. Did they hear about the Wrocław about the Wrocław Poznań line? What? Is this the Mexico City kind of bullshit? Oh my God! Why is BKP? I mean, yes, it could happen anywhere. I mean, yes, I mean, yeah. In France, they have those sinkholes. There's World War One or sinkholes, but first of all, World War One or sinkhole. Second, the train did not derail. Like, this is not something that's supposed to happen. I mean, even in Germany, we managed to have this not happen. The trains only um, have bridged, uh, only run into bridges and then collapse on them. Really? Why? Pony, why? Why? I mean, okay, but still, like, like, 
in Italy they have geology and I don't think that they do that. Why? Anyway, are there um, other questions about this? Um, I'm going to see if I can hit stop at four hours. Yeah, of course, of course. But I mean, I mean, yeah. If the if your embankment is sinking, then yeah, you should rebuild it. But the you should not have embankments. Yeah, it was a long stream because I because it actually turned because I always um, misunderestimate how long it takes me to uh, um, uh, how long it takes me to do um, crayon. Like all of my crayon streams are very long um, or partial. Like I mean, the I have this. So the post where I have this New Jersey transit speed limits from. Uh, it's called how fast New York Regional Railroad could be. End up being split into three parts because I literally spent all night and needed to, and like was falling asleep after many hours of working them, like two at a time. Yeah, sure. Um, thanks, Rob, and and thanks, Bonnie, for for sticking around for four hours. I know that says three fifty-seven. They're wrong. Um, so. Thank you all for watching, and I know this was a very exhaustingly long stream for me too. Um, so I'll see you in a week with another topic, DBD, and ciao, ciao. Thanks, thanks, Renaki.